Chapter 9, Final Choice in the Russian State Duma One of the main cards played by the leading candidates during the election campaign, as we remember, was the card of relations with Russia. Kabich actively exploited the problem of introducing a single currency, creating a ruble zone, and with the help of state media, he actually used the topic. Lukashenko had to surpass his competitor in the field of integration, but here it was necessary to somehow authoritatively declare oneself, sharply shaking up the public consciousness. The headquarters believed that Lukashenko's visit to the State Duma of the Russian Federation could best contribute to this. The visit was organized by Valery Tsapkalo, a brilliant graduate of Mjimo. He turned out to be a complete stranger to the Belarusian nomenclature, including the diplomatic one, and Lukashenko gave him a chance to break out of the lower floors of diplomacy in one fell swoop, immediately jumping over several steps. Therefore, it was very much in the interests of Tsapkala to provide a number of high-profile image campaigns for the election campaign. The matter was complicated by the fact that the terms of the visit agreed upon by him, as luck would have it, coincided with the betrayal of the leaders of the Slavic Council, and the trip to Moscow in such a situation would inevitably look like an attempt at self-justification. Therefore, most members of the headquarters opposed the visit. Only Bulakhov, Tsapkalo and I actively supported the idea of the visit. Sinitsin, as always in controversial cases, preferred to remain silent expectantly. Lukashenko listened to everyone and categorically stated, the majority decided, so be it, I will not go, everyone dispersed, and two days later we learned from the press that our candidate had, after all, visited the Duma, it was quite in his spirit, in the Duma, Tsapkalo had connections mainly in the LDPR faction, so this faction acted as the host. She also provided time for her press conference for Lukashenko's meeting with journalists. Thus, the visit to the Duma was actually a visit to Vladimir Zhirinovsky's faction, but no one in Belarus paid much attention to it. Taking advantage of the status of people's deputy, Lukashenko suggested that Narod Negazeta publish the text of his speech in the Duma and the editor of the parliamentary edition, Iosif Seredik 120 although he had little faith in Lukashenko's victory, but openly played against Kabich, he willingly printed the provided text, in principle, in the Duma Lukashenko repeated everything that he said in Belarus, it was about a systemic crisis in the Belarusian economy, about overstocked warehouses of Belarusian factories, and finally, about former military towns, devoid of any prospects, he especially dwelled on his initiative to revive the Union on a new basis, I propose to the free parliaments, I mean the fraternal Ukrainian one, to immediately create official parliamentary groups for negotiations on the development of a mechanism for uniting the fraternal republics. I hope that the president and government of Russia will support this. The time for destruction is gone. The time for creation has come. It is necessary to get together and do it in Belovskaya Pusha, in Viskuli, it will be symbolic, it is there that one can seriously and frankly discuss the political and economic conditions for the integration that we all need so much, of course, this will not be the restoration of the Soviet Union, not the transformation of Belarus and Ukraine into some kind of province, but a responsible and faithful step towards restoring normal life 121. From a practical point of view, the speech in the Duma could seem like a complete failure to someone, the speech of the guest provoked a protest from the Russia's choice faction, recall that it was then a pro-government faction, F. Boris Zalatukin, who spoke on her behalf, said that only official representatives of other states have the right to speak from the rostrum of the State Duma, 
He made it clear that Lukashenko is using the rostrum of the Duma in the election campaign for the presidency of Belarus. The representative of the communist faction offered to open discussions on the issue raised by Lukashenko. However, the Duma rejected this idea. 132 deputies voted for, 51 against, 12 abstained. The quorum for the decision is 225 votes. Then Alexander Nevzrov, on behalf of the Russian Way parliamentary group headed by Sergei Bobrin, proposed making a note in the minutes of the Duma meeting that Lukashenko's initiative, aimed at bringing the parliaments and peoples of Russia and Belarus closer together, welcomed by the Duma. This proposal was also not supported 122, but on the other hand, politically, the very appearance of a candidate from the street in the Duma, and even with the scandal, was a strong move. Belarusans are accustomed to the fact that contacts at the official level are carried out exclusively by the top leaders of the country, the prime minister and the head of parliament. In the short years of sovereignty, there were quite a few such contacts, but no one felt any benefit from them. The government trumpeted about the restoration of the ruble zone, seeing in this the main trump card of the election campaign of Vyacheslav Kabich. The population believed and waited that it was about to start using the same currency as Russia, in this case Russian rubles, instead of bunnies again. But the idea of a ruble zone unexpectedly ran into an unforeseen circumstance. Cabbage starts to worry the unforeseen circumstance had a name as well as an academic degree and the status of the chairman of the board of the National Bank of the Republic of Belarus. They called the circumstance Stanislav Bogdankovich. Professor Bogdankovich, despite all the actions of the government, insisted on the independence of the National Bank of Belarus, that is, on maintaining the right to issue, the right to create their own gold and foreign exchange reserves. I will never agree to give the assets of the National Bank to the disposal of another state. When we were sitting in Chernomirden's office, shocking, then Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Economy of Russia, A.F., said, if you put the question like that, we are ready, as an exception, the building itself, the building of the National Bank, A.F., remain in the ownership of Belarus, do we need such a handout, all this has nothing to do with the economic union, integration is the exchange of products of labor, the free movement of capital, the rejection of customs, I'm in favor with both hands 123, only politicians and economists knew about Bogdankovich's stubbornness, but in fact, a well thought out and clearly reasoned position, who did not want to violate the constitution and abandon the national currency for the sake of Kabich's political career, the people saw something else, the government promises to introduce the Russian ruble, and does nothing, that is why the very fact of Lukashenko's visit to the state Duma caused an extremely nervous reaction from Kabich, it is no coincidence that Narodna Gazeta, a line below the text of Lukashenko's speech in the Duma, reported, an hour before the newspaper was signed for publication, it became known that Prime Minister V. Kabich urgently flew to Moscow, Kabich had another reason for concern, based on the information of the Interfax agency, Narodna Gazeta made a very serious note, at a press conference held after his speech in the Duma, a, Lukashenko, answering questions from journalists, said that one of the goals of his stay in Moscow was to study the facts of the sale by the Belarusian government weapons to Croatia. This was already quite a serious blow. The statement that the government of sovereign Belarus was selling weapons in circumvention of the UN embargo was an unequivocal denunciation that allowed Vyacheslav Kabich to be immediately transferred from among Russia's allies to the number of suspects. Sanctions against the former Yugoslavia were imposed with the consent of the Kremlin. 
Patakrovkenko, the main target of this blow, evaluates this statement as follows, these were insinuations sucked from the finger, behind this provocation were clearly Georgi Trezevich, who was recently transferred to Warsaw, Valery Tsapkalo and, possibly, Valery Kass, who was expelled from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for incompetence, most likely, Lukashenko simply composed here, because he did not voice any facts confirming such a violation of international obligations in reality, and Lukashenko himself, after the victory, left this topic without consequences. The parties comprehend black PR however, not only Lukashenko light, we can say that the main principle of the entire 1994 campaign was the conscious lie of both leading teams, the outsiders turned out to be either less pragmatic or more moral, in particular, at the suggestion of Kabich's headquarters on June 14 in the newspaper Soviet Belarus under the title Belarus is pregnant with the first president, who will become it. An article purported to be a reprint from the Dutch newspaper Amsterdam Goofier was published, it distorted the facts from the biography of Stanislav Shashkovich, it was thanks to him, the son of a Catholic Pole and a Polish Jewess, that more than 200 Catholic churches were opened in Orthodox Belarus, and only two dozen Orthodox churches, Russophobia and extreme nationalism were attributed to him. It was clear that the article was written either in Minsk or in Moscow, not a single European would raise issues of religiosity and national correctness in such a wild form as it was done in the article, already at the end of the election campaign. Stanislav Shashkovich managed to defend his honor and dignity through the court, proving that the Dutch original of this article never existed. Alexander Lukashenko, of course, also got a bucket of accusations, in particular, two days before the vote, Belarus and state television showed a story in which a stewardess of a government plane informs viewers that, allegedly, a few years ago, Lukashenko's deputy during a visit to China, stole a bag of sweets and an electric massager from her, according to rumors, the transfer was inspired by Kabich's press secretary Colonel Zamatolin 124, I remember I called Lukashenko at the hotel and asked if he had seen this story, after a moment's pause, the presidential candidate asked me, Sasha, do you believe in this? Of course, I didn't believe it. None of the deputy ministers who allegedly flew in this plane, and now shown on television right in a hospital bed, could not convince me that it was like that, and not only me, almost no one believed what he said, an unknown stewardess better than any agitator convinced voters that the authorities are afraid of Alexander Lukashenko, and therefore it is worth voting for him 125, however, black, or dark, as they usually say about dubious stories, technologies were by no means alien to Lukashenko's team, let's try to figure out one of these sensational stories, shot in Leosno on June 17, during a trip around the Vitebsk region in the Leosno district, the car of presidential candidate Lukashenko, owned by deputy Ivan Titenkov, was fired upon by unknown persons, in addition to Lukashenko and Titenkov, MP Viktor Shyman was in the car, television and radio immediately spread the version according to which the assassination attempt was conceived at Lukashenko's headquarters and developed by Bulakhov and Guncha. When I rushed to the headquarters, Viktor Guncha, white as a sheet, was already sitting there, with all his appearance, he seemed to be asking, do you believe in this nonsense, Zinaida Guncha says 126, the fact that Vitya had nothing to do with this is a fact, because at that time they didn't even communicate, 
Bulakhov and Goncha could not have had anything to do with this incident, if only because Lukashenko no longer trusted them at that moment, but there were others, those who enjoyed trust, for example, Leonid Sinitsin, I learned about the shot near Leosno, like everyone else, in the morning, they left for Leosno, somewhere in the afternoon, in the morning they arrived and said that there was such a case, they sat on the radio, and we discussed what had happened, what actually happened there, I still don't know, although we didn't see anything terrible in this story at that time, what doesn't happen in elections, the authorities immediately demanded an investigation into the incident, on the one hand, it was necessary to prove that the government had nothing to do with this, on the other hand, to point to the true culprit of the incident, Valery Pavlov recalls, I called Konstantin Mikhailovich Platonov, then, first deputy minister of internal affairs of Belarus, F, asked to take specialists and fly by helicopter to Leosno, to really sort everything out, the helicopter of the Ministry of Defense provided them. Yuri Zakharenko was also part of the group 127, and when they returned, Zakharenko greeted him and said, we brought the grave, I say, how so, yes he says, they were shooting, Mercedes was standing, they were shooting at a standing car, the staging was played out in the purest way, then, both before and after that, only one thing did not allow justice to be done, Cabbage's gentleness, ah, well, 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 they shot, although all this guard, by and large, should have been arrested, regardless of the fact that they are deputies, shooting is the use of weapons, well, then, the investigation and that's it, well, I won't say who shot it, the results of the initial investigation were announced on television, but no one believed them. Everything that was said at that moment against Lukashenko in the public mind turned into additional points for the disgraced candidate. They are afraid, they slander, it means that he is a worthy person, you need to support him. The pistol used to shoot at the Mercedes was never found. Arkady Beredin told me a few years later that on the eve of the memorable trip to Leosno, Victor Scheiman asked him to get a neutral pistol somewhere, Barodic got it, a few days after the Leosno incident, the pistol was returned by Vitti the Silent to the owner with a short but very characteristic phrase, not useful, one can only guess why Yuri Zakharenko, who knew well what happened near Leosno, would later agree to become the Minister of Internal Affairs in Lukashenko's government, Valery Pavlov, for example, explains it this way, normal person, I think everything is connected with the fact that he was invited and told, well, what would I say, for example, if I were Lukashenko, here he would say, well, there was something there, well, the boys were joking, what's wrong with that? What doesn't happen in elections, right? A young man is offered an awesome position, he would have to go through three or four steps to this position, and he immediately became a minister, and this question is forgotten, and secondly, most importantly, the winners are not judged, it seems that this was the case, and the coincidence of Pavlov's assumption with the assessment of the head of Lukashenko's headquarters Sinitsin, Nothing happens in elections indirectly confirms this, Zakharenko himself will begin to tell the truth only after his resignation, but then few people will believe him, they will consider that resentment speaks in the young general, the second curator of the investigation, General Gennady Levitsky, who at that time was the head of the Belarus and KGB soon after the elections left as the ambassador of Belarus to Israel, in which rank, contrary to all diplomatic norms, he stayed for more than nine years, and, was silent, neither left nor right but the campaign was lost by the authorities not only because they were not believed even when they told the truth, the people were willing to deceive themselves, 
he saw Lakashan as a defender and was ready to follow him to the end. Moreover, the image of the presidential candidate Lakashenko was formed exactly with the expectations of the majority of voters, although government propaganda was pushing Lakashenko into the ranks of the so-called center-left candidates, Dubko, Novikov, Lakashenko, and the favorite, of course, Cabbage, the slogan of the future president's election campaign read, neither with the left, nor with the right, but with the people. This slogan was invented by our staff analyst Sergei Shelley when we discussed the question of how the elemental communist Lukashenko differs from the organized communist Novikov, and he was immediately picked up by Sinitsyn. Leonid Sinitsyn also proposed the basic structure of Lukashenko's future positive program, make an alliance with Russia, curb inflation, making industry work. By the way, the last point of the program was not as utopian as it was proclaimed by Lukashenko's opponents, and there was a certain economic logic in it. The same Sinitsyn, a professional builder, suggested betting on construction as an industry capable, in his opinion, of becoming the locomotive of the Belarusian economy. Next came the development of two versions of the program. Both options were never needed by anyone, since no one read any programs in 1994. They were going to vote with their hearts 128. Most of all, we feared the intrigues of the enemy in connection with the speech of our candidate on television. We knew that the Gostel radio team was strictly controlled by the government. The day before, the popular radio program Belarus and Youth was closed, the team of which frankly opposed, supporting Pozniak and Shashkovich and at the same time providing air to Alexander Lukashenko 129. Nevertheless, the opportunities for a presidential candidate to appear on state television in 1994 were in terms of today's Belarus and political reality is almost fantastic. Each candidate was given free 30-minute live speeches. This huge amount of time had to be managed somehow. It seemed to us that the Prime Minister's staff knew much better than we how to do it. And when Mikhail Sazanov and I arrived at the state radio and television with an application, it turned out that only the representative of Cabbage was ahead of us. However, the time reserved for the Premier, for some malicious intent, coincided with the broadcast of a football match, then with the next episode of the Brazilian soap opera, we were shocked, it turned out that Cabbage's headquarters almost deliberately set up their own candidate, Sinitsin and I developed the script for the future live broadcast, it was necessary to provide the effect of direct communication with the people, Therefore, at our request, a direct multi-channel telephone line was installed in the studio, for questions from viewers, it was impossible to answer all the questions, so we agreed that Lukashenko would answer homework, and only occasionally, on real direct calls, I know that only questions were prepared, the candidate flatly refused to rehearse the answers, relying on his gift as an improviser, and not in vain, instead of an announcer from state television, a representative of the headquarters submitted questions. During the first program, it was me, during the second and third, it was Leonid Sinitsin, who politely pushed me aside with the words, it should be easier, easier. The problem was with his hands, Lukashenko could not decide what to do with them for this half an hour. We agreed that the hands are on the table, and the camera all the time snatched out these huge, manly grasping hands, which, as if before a battle, are clenched into fists, but already on the second broadcast, Alexander Grigoryevich got used to it, and his hands fly freely, as one of the enthusiastic viewers later said, later, 
This incredible looseness Lukashenko's gestures will be noted during the filming of the first program for the president of Belarus the moment of truth and Andrei Krolov. At the same time, the first tears in Lukashenko's eyes will be captured when it comes to Belarus and gymnasts. Read girls, I repeat once again, Lukashenko was his own image maker and director. No one felt better than him what and how to tell people, but this does not mean at all that we did not have preliminary directing of his speeches and meetings with the electorate. As a rule, the same premeditated scheme was repeated everywhere. At first, the candidate's confidant spoke, Deputy Viktor Kaczynski, former military political worker, pilot, short, broad-shouldered young guy, he literally burned with energy, Sinitsin called it warm up the audience, he recalls, Kaczynski did it skillfully, the audience became plastic right before their eyes, then Lukashenko came out and chopped this plasticine, lined up everyone in the hole exactly as he needed, next to the choleric Kaczynski, Lukashenko immediately struck the hole with his calmness, even phlegm, but as the finale grew, the energy grew, the hoarse voice became louder, the speech became harder, more convincing, and in the end, answers to questions, always a brilliant impromptu conclusion, however, people's questions were basically the same, Lukashenko could only improvise, remembering what he had said before, chief assistant, Cabbage, Lukashenko's oratorical abilities were especially evident between the first and second rounds of voting, when Cabbage's headquarters unexpectedly suggested using the form of televised debates, it was hard to come up with anything more deadly for the Prime Minister, Sazanov and I, who were delegated to negotiate with Cabbage's press secretary Vladimir Zamatolin feared most of all that he would suddenly abandon the debate, off the hook, but we were afraid in vain, Zamatolin himself began to persuade us, and he even agreed to the form of debate imposed by us with the participation of journalists, who in those days mostly hated cabbage, during the debate, Lukashenko simply smeared the opponent on the wall, Vyacheslav Kabich, accustomed to a prepared audience, which his staff officers obligingly gathered for him, unsuccessfully tried to force his opponent to move on to discussing some specific issues, so you say that you will start the factories, and how will you do it? With the persistence of the former head of the industry department of the Central Committee of the CPB, Kabich examined his opponent, let's start, you didn't start, but we will, Lukashenko answered cheerfully, like a C student in an exam, and that was enough, the people needed confident and simple answers to simple questions, we will do, we know how, in relation to the current leader, the presumption of innocence practically did not work, but with an excess of faith, he passed on to everything, no matter what his rival was blocking, the invitation of journalists also turned out to be a loss for Cabbage, they were expected to drive Lukashenko into a corner, but in vain, after all, what, for example, did I say to the then staff correspondent of Izvestia, Alexander Sterikovich, persuading him to come to the debate, you still don't like Cabbage much more than Lukashenko, and it worked and Zamatolin, for example, strongly persuaded one of the representatives of the press to ask the Prime Minister what the prospects for the harvest were, but until the very end of the program, Cabbage did not wait for the pass to the agrarian sector of the electoral field and he had to pass to himself, well, why doesn't anyone ask me what are the prospects for the harvest? The views, as it turned out, were not bad, only the harvest, after the elections, had to be harvested not by the one who sought. Everyone and everything worked against the Prime Minister, even the Belarus and Popular Front, the most structurally ramified party, which, 
precisely for this reason, should have been the most well informed, so its rival not in Lukashenko, but in Kabich, Valentina Trigubovich says, the main opponent for everyone in the election campaign was Kabich, speaking against Kabich, telling what he was doing wrong, that the communist system had become obsolete, we received support, even in the most remote villages, where we came and sat, whom will you vote for, only not for Kabich, this task was then completed, as they say, 100%, if only not Kabich, and I think that just this general attitude gave us what we got, it was clear, everyone who worked against Kabich, seeing him as the main contender, voluntarily or involuntarily helped our candidate, even those who couldn't stand it, well, most of all, of course, Kabich himself helped him with his awkward stuff, Three words about finance entrepreneurs were a special sector of the electoral field, their votes were not so numerous, but the point is not in the votes, but in material support, cheap is cheap, but you can't run a campaign without money, during the 1994 elections, I had no contact with financial issues, therefore I have to quote the statements of those who understand this incomparably better than me, almost the only Belarusian businessman who could be considered a national oligarch recalls Alexander Pupko 130, in March 1994 a meeting of the club of directors took place, as I was told, Bulakhov and Guncha spoke at it, to put it mildly, with an appeal to all those present to organize support for Lukashenko, they did not doubt the victory and clearly stated that if one of those present did not help them, then after the victory it would be bad for him, we had already made our choice then, and our people tried to convince both those present and representatives of Lukashenko's team that our choice for Belarus would be better. We failed, but this contact with Lukashenko's campaign headquarters repeatedly backfired on us. In one of the newspaper interviews Alexander Pupko speaks about another case. I have a difficult relationship with the Komsomol members. I call businessmen Komsomol members who come from that world. A representative of this group addressed me in a completely rude manner in 1994. Support Lukashenko, who is winning the elections, I had to put it in place 131, the choice of Alexander Pupko, who had successfully earned more than 1 million dollars by that time, was well thought out, we consciously, I, my colleagues, my friends, those who were connected with me by all sorts of ties, including economic ones, supported Shashkovich. Nevertheless, rationality required some package investments, and in view of the fact that I had good relations with some members of the Cabbage team, we provided some intellectual assistance to them too. Among the candidates in 1994, Shashkovich was, of course, the most preferable. But if, if the votes were so disintegrated that Kabich would be chosen, it would not be a big tragedy for Belarus, because Kabich still often fought in the right direction. But if Pupko tried to calculate everything and was guided by a certain logic, as it should be for a businessman, this did not mean at all that the whole business thought the same way as he did. Valery Krugovoy testifies 132 in 1994, one of the leaders of the first Republican investment fund, Priv, one of the very Komsomol members that Pupko mentioned, contacts between me and Alexander Semenkov, one of the co-owners of Priv, F, were mainly with Mr. Bulakhov, through him with Mr. Guncha, 
and when Lukashenko's election campaign began, these people sent a request for financial help, and not just to help personally, but for us to attract those people whom we knew in business. Well, we held a couple of such secret meetings with various entrepreneurs, it was decided to help with a certain amount, true, there were people who said, we will never help this in our lives, but after a while, the same Bulak have said, guys, don't, save the money for other tasks, there is someone to finance it, so I know that certain amounts were dumped, but they were small amounts, although we were preparing for a larger volume, we were told brief members tried to help Lukashenko, of course, counting on subsequent dividends, Alexander Semenkov, who was destined to become the first prisoner among those involved in the presidential campaign, also helped 133, Alexander Semenkov took an active part in the campaign to elect the president of the Republic of Belarus on the side of Alexander Lukashenko, helping his team solve both organizational and financial issues, a certain Nikolai Guskov authorized Lukashenko G, who lives in the village, Ryskovichi, Shklovsky district, drive a vast 21,091 car, State number 0058 KS without the right to alienate for a period of three years, the witness Guskov and B. Semenkov's brother-in-law, sister's husband, who was invited to the court, confirmed that, indeed, this car was purchased in his name from Semenkov's personal funds and, at the request of Alexander Gavrilovich, he handed it over by proxy for the use of Alexander Grigoryevich 134, and here is what Tamara Vinikova, who then had the largest commercial Belarus bank, recalls about this period, Ivan and Lenya applied for funding together, probably, Deputies Ivan Titenkov and Leonid Sinitsin, who were inseparable at that time, AF, they didn't say they were asking for campaign finance, they were asking for a huge loan for a firm that had an account with another bank. Banks in such cases require the transfer of the client's account to themselves, since otherwise they cannot exercise control. When a representative of the company came and was asked to transfer the account of his company to us, he was extremely surprised. What kind of control can we talk about if the money goes to the election campaign? He was denied funds. Later, when he appointed me to the post of head of the National Bank, and Lenya was categorically against it, he reprimanded a G with resentment that the president was removing those who helped, and appointing me, although I refused to finance the campaign 135, we did not talk about this with Sinitsin, for obvious reasons, I did not expect any comments on this from him, there are things that people do not admit to themselves, but Leonid Sinitsin gave me explanations on a close occasion, Already at the end of the elections a rumor will spread widely that the former resident of Minsk, U.S. citizen Joseph Leviton was involved in financing Lukashenko's election campaign, but Leonid Sinitsin carefully refutes these rumors. Leviton, a sociable person, was engaged in business, since he communicated with us, and with me and with many others, a false impression was created that Leviton was somehow related to this matter, of course, we needed money, of course, we talked about this, but there was no help and support from nowhere, in any case, there was absolutely no support from Leviton, he was not a player in this game, I admit, it's hard to believe this. After all, Iosif Leviton was the actual owner of the same Chernobyl Heritage Foundation in which Ivan Titenkov worked as director, so externally there is a connection, the same as our headquarters had, perhaps also outwardly, 
with Arkady Barodik, Alexander Kichkalo, Mikhail Chich, the latter, according to rumors, invested 5,000 personal dollars in the Lakashan election campaign, which, however, can neither be confirmed nor denied until Chich himself brings clarity to this story. In any case, the vast majority of those businessmen who sided with Lakashenka in 1994 are silent today, although they probably repent of their choice, but in 1994 they did not repent, they, like all of us, sincerely thought that the most important thing was to topple cabbage, and they threw him down, now, Ten years later, everything is assessed completely differently, and Vyacheslav Kabich appears not only not the worst of evils, but downright the father of the failed Belarusian democracy. Excuse me, dear Vyacheslav Rancevich, Kabich was in fact not the worst of the possible leaders of Belarus, he was neither evil nor vindictive, he was democratic in his own way. He liked doing good to people, in addition, Vyacheslav Rancevich was undoubtedly a competent manager, let us remember with what respect Vasily Leonov speaks of Kabich of the Soviet era in his memoirs, young, businesslike, especially against the background of his colleagues, most of whom simply did not solve anything 136, even his shortcomings were a continuation of his virtues. He quite sincerely believed in the decency of people, loved the noisy company, and remembered good things about a person in the first place. In addition, a pupil of the old nomenclature system, Kabich is used to playing by strict rules. He could not lie in the face of the people. Let's start the factories. Then after all, you need to be responsible for your words and not just throw them 137. However, the first round of voting already showed that Lukashenko's coming to the post of head of the Belarusian state is inevitable, as the night turns to evening, by a huge margin, Alexander Lukashenko is in first place, 42%, Vyacheslav Kabich is in second place, 17.4, followed by Zinan Pozniak, 12.9, Stanislav Shashkovich, 9.9, .9, Alexander Dubko, 6.0, Vasily Novikov, 4.2138. According to the Public Control Commission, Lukashenko wins already in the first round, but his headquarters does not take any action to challenge the results announced by the Central Election Commission. If they were officially refuted, the elections could be declared invalid, and the nomenclature would have a chance to recover from fear and prevent another Lukashenko's nominations. I was on duty at the headquarters telephone both nights of the counting of votes, both in the first and in the second round. I remember how on the first night nervously, vying with each other, our observers from the polling stations called, trying to report the results, in the regions, under the chairman of the regional executive committees, deputies of the Supreme Council were on duty, whose task was to prevent possible falsifications, the headquarters asked that the deputies who were on duty in the regions should by all means see the chairman of the regional executive committees before they call us back, everyone called back pretty quickly, there was only a call from Mogilev, no one could answer where the head of the region, Nikolai Grinev, was, it was pointless to look for him, since this typical representative of the Belarusian nomenclature had obvious grief, the Mogilev region elected its president in the first round of voting. Now is the time to say a few words about the role played in the defeat of Vyacheslav Kabich by the nomenclature, the state apparatus that served him faithfully, how officials behaved during the election campaign. Here is what Anatoly Labidko who supervised the Vitebsk region as a deputy and a member of the headquarters, says, there was everything, the nomenclature treated us differently, in general, everything developed quite democratically, 
officials could do their job behind the scenes or behind the scenes, but at least they made contact. The local authorities also went in different ways to organize our meetings with voters, but at least no one, with a few exceptions, disrupted these meetings. It was pointless to go to any negotiations between the two headquarters. Peter Krovkenko recalls, the essence of the negotiations was reduced to a two-way move, I am the president, you are the prime minister, interestingly, these were counter-proposals, and each of the teams tried to convince the other that this was the only reasonable way out of the current situation, a kind of compromise, however, this was not enough for Lukashenko and for Kabich it was simply humiliating to be Prime Minister under Lukashenko, why couldn't the nomenclature, the state apparatus resist the onslaught of a person who did not have his own party, who did not have powerful financial support, who did not rely on the political power of any strong state outside of Belarus, firstly, the power of state propaganda was too great, and officials were not the least victims of it, they all believed that Kabich would win, even if they did not break the law and rig the elections, and the crowds of voters, who did not hide who they voted for, were perceived by state officials as phantoms, the second reason is control, at that time, none of the officials could even think of sending public observers from the polling station, not to mention international observers, observers were sitting at all electoral precincts, where it was possible, who, having received the protocols, were obliged to immediately call and transfer these figures to the center, there was an unofficial phone to which all information was dumped, and this system just gave more reliable information. From some polling stations, observers managed to get through before the chairman of this commission contacted the Central Election Commission. Finally, there is a third reason. This is a general fatigue. Officials are tired of the weakness of power, tired of the absence of a center that makes decisions for them. Valerie Kruger voice said this well. I think this apparatus wanted to comply, and, in fact, there was no problem to subdue him, after all, the state apparatus has always obeyed, from the central committee of the Ksu to Kabich, and the apparatus, as it were, did not have a moment of free life, if we take business, even the same newspapers, the press, they all had some time of some kind of freedom, albeit relative, but the apparatus never had it, it was in the last days of Kabich that the officials began to be a little self-willed when they sensed his personal weakness, and here is how political scientist Oleg Bogutsky recalls that campaign 139 in those days, an activist of the campaign headquarters of Stanislav Shashkovich, I myself sat in one of the district executive committees, there was no observation as such, and besides, observers were not allowed to participate in the counting procedure, despite the fact that I had two mandates, a deputy of the local council and an assistant to a deputy of the Supreme Council, I was harshly told, we allow you to sit here only because we worked with you in the city committee of the Komsomol and we don't give a damn about your mandates, if you twitch, the police will take you out, and then you can complain about us, the problem was elsewhere, there was no call from Minsk indicating what result should be announced, the results were not summed up until 4am, everyone was waiting, calling back to neighboring areas, we needed a team, but there was none, only in the morning they relaxed, got drunk and gave equal numbers, but it was only a local initiative, each gave the numbers he wanted, someone gave victory to Kabich, someone gave approximately the same results, and someone did not want to take responsibility and gave the truth, if Kabich had decided to falsify, 
he would have become president in the first round, officials still had a chance to prevent Lukashenko's victory, it was enough for them to disrupt the second round of elections, this was very much feared in our campaign headquarters, one could see how nervously the usually calm Sinitsin smoked when the conversation turned to the second round, what if Kabich withdraws his candidacy, what then? Will there be a vote on Lukashenko's candidacy, or will the name of the bronze medalist of the presidential race, Zinan Pozniak, be next to his name on the ballot? This would inevitably work to reduce the turnout, as well as the presence of only one name on the ballot, but the prime minister turned out to be a calf doomed to be slaughtered, he was led to the slaughter, and he walked, humbly bowing his head and not resisting. An unexpected blow was dealt to Vyacheslav Kabich by the chairman of the Supreme Council, Mechislav Grip. He, apparently considering that his finest hour had come, addressed the voters from the TV screen before the second round. The presidential campaign is coming to an end. They ask me what position the leadership of the Supreme Council takes. I said then, and I confirm now, that the chairman, the Presidium of the Supreme Council acted and acted in strict accordance with the Constitution of the Republic of Belarus, they did everything to ensure that the elections were held, that they were held in a calm democratic atmosphere 140, it's okay, these are, as always, the general correct words, but what Grip says next can also be regarded as an attack against both candidates, dear citizens. The situation, the choice that we need to make on July 10, forced me to turn to you, to your mind, to your prudence, presidents will come and go, such is the law, but the people will remain forever emphasis added by me, F, 141, but voting with reason does not mean in this case voting against both candidates, against Kabich as a loser and against Lukashenko as a split in society. Personally, Matchislav Hrib would be completely satisfied with the disruption of the second round. If the elections do not take place, then, according to the Constitution, an acting president will be appointed, who will become the guarantor of the rights and freedoms of citizens until the next elections. This acting would be the chairman of the Supreme Council, that is, Matchislav Hrib himself. That is exactly how, like a step in the back, this speech of Hrib was then and is regarded now by many members of the campaign headquarters of Vyacheslav Kabich. There were reasons, even if the general simply maneuvered between the two candidates, for the state apparatus this was a signal to escape from the sinking ship, the people have made their choice and so it happened, the nomenclature is completely demoralized and is trying to demonstrate its loyalty to the favorite, the government is virtually inactive. The results of the first round had a rather sobering effect on other presidential candidates, unlike Kabich, before the second round, Zinan Pozniak, Stanislav Shashkovich and Vasily Novikov called on their supporters to vote against everyone, but that didn't change anything either. The result of the second round, which took place on July 10, 1994, is logical. Alexander Lukashenko, 81%, Vyacheslav Kabich, 14%. I was personally struck by the fact that despite the delay in the receipt of data from the Minsk region, Lukashenko still gained an absolute majority of votes, even if the whole Minsk region did not vote. When this became clear, Sinitsin, usually strict and observant of headquarters discipline, pulled out two bottles of champagne from somewhere, and this was the first alcohol drunk in the campaign headquarters of Alexander Lukashenko, General and Deputy Valery Pavlov recalls what happened at Kabich's headquarters, the red red sun rose slowly, it was 4 am, 
We were sitting in the office of Gennady Ilyich Danilov, there were many of us, and the fact that they write that they were drunk is all nonsense, everyone was not up to it, I silently got out, got into the car and drove home to sleep, I was driving and realized that in my life, in the life of our state, something is changing, changing towards a radically new one, then I came to work. Vyacheslav Rancevich did not gather anyone, but the people simply gathered, all those who always came to him came, deputies, heads of some departments, there was such a painful silence, someone sighed, someone panicked, well, he, Kabich, F, says, well, the people made their choice, he clearly said, the people made their choice, what we lost is also the choice of the people. Apparently, we did not do everything right, this is also an assessment of the work of our headquarters, which means that we did everything wrong, this is how the old power left, with dignity, without clinging to the law, party, king or not king I spoke about my first meeting with Alexander Lukashenko at the beginning of the book, now a few words about our last meeting. On the morning before, the president signed a decree on the resignation of the editor-in-chief of the newspaper Soviet Belarus Igor Osinsky, and the next day, Nikolai Galko, a parliamentary columnist for Narodna Gazeta, was appointed editor of Sovetskaya Belrussia, and Pavel Yakubovich became his first deputy 142, while signing the decree, the president asked me, did you write a letter of resignation, you take your time, I don't give up my people, I said that, of course, he makes the decision, but I ask him, if the resignation is not accepted, at least to listen to me on those issues that are within my competence, if he still trusts me, I don't give up my people, Lukashenko listened to me, but did not hear me, he repeated what had already been said, which was tantamount to a reminder, if you follow orders, you will continue to work, no problem, this was my last personal conversation with the President of the Republic of Belarus, it took place on December 30, 1994. I did not yet know that in three days I would demand from the head of the administration, Leonid Sinitsin, to satisfy my request for dismissal, of your own accord 143, fool, Sinitsin said, he always treated me well, be patient until May, elections to the Supreme Soviet, F, you will be a deputy, or you will go as an ambassador, wherever you want, to Switzerland. I don't want to go anywhere, tell me better, to whom to transfer the case, Sinitsen sighed heavily, I was not the first to leave, and, apparently, far from the last, cases, as you probably know, in such cases are handed over to the deputy, but you think, I no longer wanted to think, too many things happened before, let's try to sort them out in order. Chapter 1. Our people do not rush to share portfolios already after the first round of voting, I felt extremely uncomfortable, the influence of Guncher and Bulakhov in our team was felt less and less, but the influence of Ivan Titenkov was felt more and more, but since at the headquarters everyone perceived him only as Sinitsin's deputy for housekeeping, that is, simply as a supply manager 144 who should in no way push back politicians and ideologists, let alone command them, I once asked Bulakhov, Dmitry Patrovich, don't you think we have too many Titankovs, Bulakhov's answer, visibly gleaming from the feeling of an imminent victory and impending coming to power, was quite optimistic, Sasha, calm down. Ivan is a businessman, he needs money, and we will run the country, however, very soon I saw that his optimism was not so unambiguous, Volodymyr Nistyuk, a member of the campaign headquarters, says, there were about 12 people at the table, the first question that was raised at that moment was the question, 
how to win the second round, Lukashenko asked everyone to speak on this topic. The proposals were different, in which districts to strengthen the campaign brigades, where to add printed materials, etc., that is, the question was about the technical implementation of the second stage, but Dmitry Bulakhov and I started talking about something else, I personally said that in order to govern the country, you need to have a team, in general, more powerful, Lukashenko's reaction was stormy, you are my team, you are all talented, you are all the first, you are all the best, and, of course, none of you should be offended, then the conversation turned to who could be appointed to some posts, it is clear that the conversation was not very specific, even streamlined, but I myself saw tears in the eyes of our candidate when he said that we are the best of the best and that together we will go further, and there can be no questions, for some reason I was not at that meeting, but he remembered the phrase that Dmitry Bulakhov gave me, they come to power with one team, they manage this power with the other he said confidently, but not at all so optimistically 145, with all the dramatic and even sincere assurances of devotion to his people Alexander Lukashenko understood well that the team that brought him to power was anything but a team of managers, a conflict on this ground was bound to arise, and it did, Leonid Sinitsin testifies, naturally, we discussed where and how to employ the people who worked at the headquarters, because each person implied that after the campaign he would participate in something, realize himself in something, but many were not quite adapted to practical work. Lukashenko was resolute, it is necessary to get rid of the ballast, I strongly objected, everyone who worked with us should be attached, finally he waved his hand, okay, they say, you worked with them, so go ahead with them, I'll give you all six months for this, I did so, almost everyone was offered a job in the administration, here the writer Yevgeny Budin as enters the conversation, only now, from the confession of Leonid Sinitsin, I understood what exactly happened then and why the intelligentsia turned away from the new government in the very first days, after all, it was represented by all these volunteer assistants in the election campaign who now settled in managerial offices and often do not have any managerial skills, do not know any rules, not to mention politeness and good tone, it just made us sick the new team really started to rule, as they say, from scratch, the offices, in which government officials who had not yet been dismissed sat, were seized one by one by the presidential army, Cabinets and boxes with official documents were thrown into the corridors, I still remember that time with shame, they looked at us like we were some kind of wild horde, but back to Sinitsin's story, we accepted for verification everyone who helped us, at the same time, it was said, if time passes, and you do not pull it, then be free, so get ready so that later without offense, I think that the attitude was really human, people are tested only in deeds, Lukashenko did not interfere, even treated with sympathy, listen, I understand how difficult it is for you to find a common language with everyone and define everyone somewhere, but he also understood something else, they took power, now they need to work concretely, here Sinitsin speaks almost the truth, the fact is that, having become the head of the presidential administration and being an experienced manager, he began by simply not hiring anyone, that is, absolutely no one, including, by the way, me, and he checked the team in action in a completely sophisticated and most painless, for himself as a leader, way. First show up, show what you are capable of in practical work, and then we will draw up documents on your employment, thus, after a while, everyone who did not pull or was not needed for one reason or another found themselves out of work, 
they were politely informed that they were not working, and never worked, there was no entry in the workbook, so, for example, the future deputy of the Supreme Council of the 13th Convocation, Victor Tereshkenko, was overboard, after the victory he hurried to feel himself in a high position so much that he even sent a paper addressed to the Minister of Foreign Affairs Vladimir Senko with a proposal to immediately employ graduates of his commercial university, in the same way, a classmate of Victor Guncha, Grodno lawyer Iosif Valento, who was compromised by an article in the Svoboda newspaper, disappeared, and these are people who almost took the posts of heads of key departments of the administration, Sasha is no more now about those who annoyed the new administration and the newly made president, the fact is that even in the team that brought Lukashenko to power, not everyone perceived him as the undisputed leader, here is Sinitsin's testimony, there was a session, it was necessary to speak at the session, Victor Guncha was assigned to prepare the president's speech, since he practically did not take part in the elections, either he was ill or had an accident, okay, Viktor Yosefovich is working on the report, we meet, I tell him that the concept of the report is not correct, a slightly different approach is needed, he replies, I will not write such a concept, well, then you're free, Guncha realized that this was no longer a political debate, but work with all the rules, including obligatory diligence, a day later, he came up, apologized and went to work, as they say, in a common stream, there is no doubt that here the head of the administration acted in concert with the president, yes, he himself confirms this, Lukashenko says, you will not curb them, neither Viktor nor Bulakhov, they will move on their own, in their own way, but I was sure that I would have the will to build anyone, if the goal was clear, and so it happened, most lined up and went to work like clockwork, and with Victor and Dima, only problems, 146 so it was seen from the site, Pyotr Krovkenko recalls, I will always remember how Bulakhov, and especially Guncha, without hiding, derogatorily walked around their bus, bantering that they would twirl them as they please, the problem of curbing former comrades in arms or colleagues in the Supreme Council immediately became very acute, they could not understand that he was already president, Lukashenko saw and felt this, taking it very painfully, and if the same Sinitsin or Kaczynski, Titenkov, Dolgolev immediately and unconditionally accepted him in a new capacity, then it was difficult for the young wolves with their ambitions to get used to the fact that Sasha is now Alexander Grigorievich forever for them, and he will run the country, not them. Naturally, it was not easy for them to come to terms with this, and to rebuild, especially since the difference was noticeable even outwardly, the wrinkled colors of presidential shirts will be striking for more than a year against the backdrop of the impeccable colors of Bulakhov, Guncha, Karpenko 147, Sasha could not arrange such a thing, this is where his quality manifested itself, which largely explains the secret of his literally overwhelming surrounding strength, always remaining a man of high conceit, and also painfully touchy, vindictive, he never left any of the offenders unpunished, Dmitry Bulakhov fell the first victim of such a confrontation, Bulakhov, a talented and bright lawyer, was promised the post of chairman of the constitutional court by Lukashenko, and, having become president, he submitted his candidacy for discussion by the Supreme Council, although he understood what could come of it, but Dmitry Bulakhov was not even 35 years old then, and the grey-haired Valery Tikinia, the former Minister of Justice and Secretary of the Central Committee of the CPB, Doctor of Law, corresponding member of the Academy of Sciences of Belarus, worked as deputy chairman of the Constitutional Court at that time, 
member of the Constitutional Court of the Republic of Belarus of the First Composition Professor Mikhail Pastukhov recalls 148 whose candidacy for this position, by the way, was once nominated by Bulakhov, when his name sounded among the applicants, for the position of a member of the Constitutional Court, F. I, of course, noted for myself that, most likely, Tikinia would be the chairman of the Constitutional Court, which no one doubted, in comparison with the experienced and well-known Minister of Femus, Bulakhov looked like just a boy, in addition, the majority of deputies frankly did not like him, as we remember, also through and through the party. Mikhail Pastukhov says, I remember going up to him and saying, Dmitry Petrovich, you know, it's still rather reckless, to be nominated at once as a judge and chairman, you will absolutely pass as a judge, you will be elected, but with the position of chairman, it is very problematic that you can be elected, because the chairman from the court has already been decided, Valery Gurevich Tikinia, but I don't think that was even the point, and the fact that the presidential administration did not carry out appropriate work among the deputies, and Bulakhov was left without support from above, true, the president conscientiously gathered the chairman of the regional councils in his office and asked them to support Bulakhov's candidacy and win her support from the deputies from their regions. The officials left the office completely dumbfounded. Samyan Domash addressed me in the corridor 149 chairman of the Grodno Regional Council. Bulakhov can pass only if Tikinia comes out in his support. Let the president talk to Valery Gurevich. I immediately approached the president and conveyed the words of Domash. He just smiled softly into his mustache and said, Good, of course, Bulakhov was voted out. Tikinia did not come out in support of him. No one, as it turned out, talked about Bulakhov with him. Later, Rumors would even spread that allegedly Sinitsin personally talked with some deputies, inciting them to vote against Bulakhov. Of course, Leonid Georgievich himself, even ten years later, denies this. There was no intrigue on my part, the deputies simply did not vote. I told him then, Dmitry Petrovich, the most normal service for you in this situation is the Ministry of Justice but he believed that his estimate was somewhat underestimated. I think the deputies played a bigger role here than Lukashenko. Intrigue, in any case, was not. Nobody even thought about it. Of course, no one thought. But then why was Bulakhov not appointed to any other position? Leonid Sinitsin continues. Lukashenko simply stopped perceiving him, apparently. Dmitry did not feel then that Lukashenko was already a president, who has the right to decide what he needs, who he needs, and in the name of what he became president in general, most likely, there were some notes of familiarity in Bulakhov's speeches, which Lukashenko felt and immediately pushed him away, as it were, Sasha Lukashenko no longer existed. To make others feel bad thus, Bulakhov did not receive the promised post, but this was not enough, Bulakhov's example was supposed to be a lesson for everyone, once and for all, therefore, it was necessary not only to push, but to politically destroy the former comrade in arms, to crush him so that this young, handsome, ambitious man felt smeared, deprived of a political perspective, and, as a result, dependent solely on his, Lukashenko, presidential will, to do this, Bulakhov should have been publicly taken out in the mud, moreover, the team immediately came up with a new position for him, Secretary of State of the Presidential Council, when Bulakhov also managed to hold a press conference as a candidate for Secretary of State, the wise Sinitsin uttered a single word, in vain, and he was not mistaken, because he was immediately run into exemplary and indicative, 
and the young lawyer fell under the wheel of the machine to combat corruption in government. He was accused of having links with businessmen, whose interests he allegedly lobbied. Ironically, one of these businessmen turned out to be Alexander Semenkov, the same Semenkov, who just yesterday helped attract the votes of businessmen and the contents of their wallets in favor of presidential candidate Alexander Lukashenko, Semenkov says. I have evidence that this was an action aimed at discrediting Bulakhov and our brief. We responded very powerfully, including in state print media, and dotted all the I points, of course, were set, but the case was presented as if Bulakhov and certain structures had an interest in this deal. Is it really without interest? Who will work without interest 150? Today, it seems indisputable that Lukashenko was preparing public opinion for the fact that there is no more Bulakhov's politician, but a deputy who is entangled in commercial transactions, using his proximity to the head of state for personal gain. Alexander Lukashenko defined the situation this way, there is a staff, there are positions, there are people who occupy them, there are just close people. Some are already fed up with their suggestions. In short, there is an attempt to actively promote and lobby. According to the president, he is actively fighting this phenomenon. None of his decisions are the result of lobbying. If someone leaves a position or does not even have time to take a high chair, although he has already trumpeted about this, this, as a Lukashenko said during a press conference, F is not the result of intrigue, but a deliberate step by the president because there was no other way 151, so, the thoughtful step of the president, it was tantamount to the command face, the point was put quite insultingly, during the president's speech at the session of the Supreme Council, during the breaks between plenary sessions, the president intends to continue to consult and agree on the projects under consideration with the leadership of the Supreme Council, with the leaders of deputy groups. All questions about the organization of such meetings will be decided by the head of the presidential administration L.G. Sinitsin and the deputies of the Supreme Council D. P. Bulakhov and A. V. Labidko, who become the official representatives of the president in the Supreme Council 152. There was a comrade in arms and a close person almost the leader of the parliament, five minutes to the chairman of the constitutional court, and became just one of the deputies whom the president, even without appointment by decree, appointed as his representatives in the Supreme Council, so to speak, padding, thus, President Alexander Lukashenko dealt with the first of his own people who naively believed quite recently that, having chosen Lukashenko as a convenient ram, they would command the parade, broken means fit in order not to return to the fate of Dmitry Bulakhov, let's say that it developed quite indicatively, Dmitry Petrovich managed to mark himself in the opposition by publishing several high-profile anti-Lukashenko articles, led for some time the stillborn party of all Belarus and unity and consent, tried his luck in business, then, much to the bewilderment of everyone who remembered the proud and adamant lawyer Bulakhov, he suddenly found himself next to Lukashenko again, at first as the ambassador of Belarus to the CIS, a little later, as the first deputy chairman of the CIS executive committee, all ten years of his reign, President Lukashenko will demonstrate an indisputable axiom, a stool in the household needs a whole one, and an assistant must be broken, so more reliable. First high-profile resignation the next object was, of course, Viktor Guncha, and like Bulakhov, he was appointed to the position immediately, but it was obvious to everyone, including Guncha himself, that he was doomed to fall out of the mechanism of power, 
Zinaida Goncha says, the fact that Lukashenko won the elections did not please Viktor at all, he understood that if a touchy person lacked something in his youth, in childhood, he would compensate for his offense by besieging bright people, this scared us, to be honest, after the announcement of the results, we were very depressed, because it would have been better if that cabbage had remained, I remember how Goncher asked me to make sure that no one bothered him to talk to Lukashenko, Goncher entered the president's office cautiously, no, no servility, just no one knew how to behave now, after being elected, and the potter came out clearly elated, after all, the president has already proposed his candidacy for the post of deputy chairman of the government, and the parliament approved it by a majority of votes, and Goncha was destined to become a headache for Alexander Lukashenko for a long time. Here is how Zinaida Goncha perceived their relationship. I saw that Lukashenko envies Victor somewhere, doesn't even love him. It seemed to me that Vitya felt his superiority, and Lukashenko, the fact that he lacked behind in education, in intelligence, it was felt, but the fact that a person isn't happy, it was felt, he wanted to be like the potter, on the one hand, he was drawn to him in order to learn something, on the other hand, he quietly hated, Zinaida Alexandrovna, it seems to me, is right. Lukashenko needed a potter, as always, a bar is needed, the height of which one wants to reach, in addition, sometimes it is so nice to see that the person who once personified for you that very unattainable height is now completely dependent on you, immediately after the appointment of Goncher as deputy prime minister, a noticeable talk of war began between him and the presidential administration. All those structures that Goncha tried to subordinate to the government were immediately taken under the jurisdiction of the administration. This was the case with the Beltler Radio Company, the National Press Center, the Berlin Form Pronos Analytical Institute, the Berlin Form News Agency, and even the government library which was immediately renamed the presidential library, it seems that jealousy for the bright and extremely efficient deputy prime minister became the main impetus for making many decisions, at the same time, Goncha was thrown into one of the most ungrateful areas, he was given the very social abyss, which is always difficult to get out of, as deputy prime minister, Goncha was responsible for education and science, social protection and health care, and culture, there is a lot of honor, but, of course, there was no money in the treasury to solve the problems of these industries successfully, it is not surprising that the potter was worn out and extremely dissatisfied with his work, in addition, he felt how quickly he was being pushed further and further away, the wife, as befits the closest person, immediately felt growing dissatisfaction, I remember very well that from the first days it did not bring him any joy, when Vitya went to work in Malodakno, he liked it, it gave him pleasure, here he devoted himself entirely to his work, I saw how he came, therefore, from the very first days I generally sat, spit you, and leave, because I see that all this is without joy, and there are absolutely no prospects, his vice premiership ended very simply, once, having gone to the head of state with a report and being not allowed to the body, moreover, for an insulting reason for the vice premier 153 Goncha could not stand it and left, leaving a letter of resignation in the reception room, he held a press conference, at which he named the atmosphere of clannishness around the president as the reason for his resignation, when the second person in the state suddenly turns out to be the manager of affairs, at a press conference, Goncha spoke for the first time about corruption in the presidential entourage, and also hinted that the incident with the shelling of Lukashenko's car in the Leosno region during the presidential elections was staged by Lukashenko himself, 
Gonchar even turned to KGB chairman Vladimir Yegrov with a call to read out the materials at the disposal of the KGB. I addressed Vladimir Yegrov as a man and an officer. None of the government supported him. After all, Titankov was too influential a figure close to the head of state. Why fight? Moreover, even the press, which usually favored Guncha, this time took his demark mostly coldly, no one saw any other reason than hysteria, a momentary flash, here Guncha left, although he could still work, he could influence the young president, benefit the country and people, why slam the door ahead of time, moreover, Guncha was not supported by anyone from the old presidential team. Perhaps because both he and Bulak have always tried to be not so much members of the team as higher ranking consultants, but the fact that the team allowed them to be thrown overboard so easily was the beginning of the end of the team itself. Chapter 2, Prices Back, Milkmaid from the State Farm Belarus repeatedly in his pre-election interviews, Lukashenko promised to bring new people to power, and where to get them new people, so that they are also competent managers, the most difficult was the problem with the candidacy of the Prime Minister, initially, Lukashenko had no candidacy for this post at all, therefore, in response to questions about the candidacy of the future Prime Minister, they had to fight off with phrases like, there are more candidates for the post of Prime Minister than for the position of a milkmaid at a state farm, bitingly said, and even too much, this phrase, thrown at a press conference after the first round of voting, was immediately replicated by the press, well-known Belarusian analyst Yuri Drakakrost called his commentary on Lukashenko's first press conference a milkmaid from the state farm Belarus, in reality, the situation with candidates was far from simple. When Mikhail Chichar's candidacy surfaced, I don't know, Sinitsin claims that it was he who suggested it, there was a lack of experienced bankers in the team that was then, we saw all the imbalance of the banking system of that period, we understood how important banks were for us, and it was not easy to find another person to replace the prime minister who would know banking and, in addition, would have the experience of a leader of a Republican scale. Before Agroprom Bank, Chich worked in the Central Committee, was not easy. Based on these considerations, we offered him this position. True, there is another explanation for why the choice was made on Mikhail Chich. Tamara Vinikova believes he, Chich, a, f, was a man who was promised a portfolio in exchange for money for the elections, and this agreement was respected. This explanation seems plausible to me, since for the first time I saw Chich at the headquarters, where he was brought by Arkady Buridin, who, as we remember, was directly involved in campaign financing. Alexander Pupko tells how such financing could take place. I believe that Chichar was appointed Prime Minister thanks to Buridin. I think that Chichar carried out the so-called package investments in the presidential elections. One of these investments was in Lukashenko and I think it went through Borodik. The scheme is simple and not new. The bank plans to build its own office building. Borodik attracts a potential contractor. Chichar starts financing the project. Part of the money goes to the cos, part settles in Koran, Barodic's company, F, and part of the money comes to the headquarters, thus, it can be considered that Chich partially financed the election of Lukashenko, but Leonid Sinitsin insists, of course, Chich and I had meetings during the work of the headquarters, but he is a cautious person, not a politician, at that time he was not involved in politics at all, of course, I hinted that it would be necessary to somehow help with finances, he said, listen, I have nothing to do with this case, about caution, this seems to be true, 
until 1999, which will be discussed ahead. Mikhail Chichar was always distinguished by increased caution 154, but his candidacy, according to personal data, was quite passable for the Supreme Council, the head of a large semi-state bank. Chich was his own for that part of the nomenclature that did not shine in public politics, but quietly did its job, including its own money, the deputies voted for him without any problems, moreover, the president proposed four vice premiers at once in a package with him, they were Sergei Lin, who held the same post in the government of Vyacheslav Kabich, Mikhail Myosnikovich, another representative of the outgoing cabinet, Vladimir Garkin, chairman of the Parliamentary Commission on Agrarian Issues, and Viktor Guncha, that saw the new people. It is no coincidence that the well-informed correspondent of Izvestia, Alexander Sterikovich, wrote in frankly mocking tones about the newly created government. So far, the situation in the cabinet of ministers certainly does not cause optimism. De facto, the main role there is played by Deputy Prime Ministers Sergei Lin and Mikhail Myosnikovich and not by the head of government Mikhail Chich, especially when you consider that Chich ended up in the post of prime minister after all the others to whom he was offered prudently refused 155, Chich satisfied Lukashenko in one more way, he was absolutely devoid of any kind of charisma, and therefore could not be perceived as a potential rival, sluggish and, as it seemed then, pathologically incapable of objecting, Chich was quite ready to carry out any presidential program, there will be tanks and machine guns here what was it like, Lukashenko's first program of priority measures to overcome the economic crisis in the country, deputy and candidate of economic sciences Alexander Suznov, who became the Minister of Labour in the first composition of the new government, spoke about how resolutely Lukashenko fought against the discrediting of the market. Lukashenko had everything mixed up, the base, the basis, is communist views, state property, goss plan, goss knob and no, so to speak, private business, but disappointment with what happened over the last 20 years of Soviet power was laid on this base, and now, due to the lack of a serious basic economic education, a kind of eclecticism formed in his head, but how did Lukashenko see the way of development of Belarus now, in the first months of his presidency, until recently, I did not really believe that he allegedly invited the Moscow reformist economist Grigory Yavlinsky to carry out reforms in Belarus, but here is what Olga Bramova, chairman of the Belarus and Association Yabloko, says, according to Yavlinsky, he was offered to take the Belarus and economy as a testing ground and do whatever he sees fit. I don't know if it is humanly possible for Yavlinsky and Lukashenko to work together, but this proposal to Yavlinsky indicated that the country's course had not been determined, because Yavlinsky's radical positions in the economic sphere are well known, and his participation could significantly turn the tide, but, obviously, Grigory Alksevich considered that the main field for the application of his efforts as a Russian national politician is Russia, and one should not be distracted. The very appearance of the name of Grigory Yavlinsky in the context of Belarus and economic realities testifies that Lukashenko was preparing for reforms after all. He did not know which ones, but in the fact that he wanted to become a reformer in the economy, there is still no doubt, he was prepared for this by his own practical activities as director of the state farm. We recall that it was Lukashenko who preached rent and self-financing, which greatly contributed to his career at the local level, the current irreconcilable opponent of Lukashenko and at that time the Minister of Agriculture and Food of the new government, Vasily Leonov, testifies to the same in print, 
the president really sincerely wanted reforms and was ready for them 156. Finally, the most serious evidence is that Michel Cambesis, managing director of the International Monetary Fund, is visiting Minsk at the invitation of the newly elected head of the Belarusian state. Cambesis' visit brought Belarus the first trench of the standby stabilization loan 157. To provide a loan, as the then Deputy Prime Minister Mikhail Myosnikovich argued, the IMF had quite good reasons. The President assured Mr. Cambesis that Belarus would not be limited to half measures, like the previous leadership, but would follow the path of large scale market reforms. 158 The IMF also had serious political motives. We have accumulated a large debt to Russia for energy. The IMF is concerned about this and is ready to provide us with support so that we do not become dependent on any one state. Since the IMF includes all the countries of the world, it can give higher guarantees of sovereignty. At the same time, however, the IMF loan was issued to Belarus. To put it mildly, in advance, since Alexander Lukashenko was constantly confused in his testimony, and market rhetoric in his speeches was very inorganically combined with anti-market ones, here, for example, is how he speaks at a session of the Supreme Council. One of the main tasks facing us is the improvement of the monetary system. The measures submitted for your discussion contain mechanisms that restrain unjustified price increases, and further, we believe it is necessary to regulate the prices of monopoly enterprises, as well as to maintain fixed tariffs for housing and communal services, transport and fuel, although this requires enormous funds from the budget 159, apparently. Feeling his own theoretical uncertainty, Lukashenko even approaches the formation of the composition of the new government in a compromise way, so that it includes both reformers and conservatives. The first anti-crisis program of the new cabinet was also presented as a kind of conceptual compromise between marketers and anti-marketers. Its main author and compiler was Deputy Prime Minister Sergei Lin, an economist of the old, communist school, as befits an experienced official. He felt exactly what the new leader of the country wants, and the program has become a kind of manifesto for a socially oriented market economy, but the most radical elements of the program were introduced by the head of the National Bank, Stanislav Bogdankovich. We have enough programs that have remained unrealized due to the lack of political will and qualified executors. Only a comprehensive solution of problems is able to improve the sick economy, create organizational, economic and legal conditions for entrepreneurship and competition, stimulate labor productivity and reduce production costs, increase savings, savings and investment, defeat inflation and ensure the growth of the national product and income 160. It is significant that Bogdankovich characterizes the programs of the previous government as remaining unrealized due to the lack of political will and qualified executors. It seemed to him that just about a little more will, determination, and the reforms will go. Bogdankovich perceives Lukashenko with his determination and readiness to go to any lengths as a battering ram capable of breaking through any wall and implementing his own program, in any case, developed on his instructions and submitted on his behalf. For the sake of this, Bogdankovich, as well as other market reformers who were then in the government, Suznov, Leonov, Guncha, were ready to endure the authoritarian methods of carrying out reforms already demonstrated by the head of state. Lukashenko resolutely confirmed this possibility of combining economic reforms with authoritarianism. I remember how once again in the presidential office he, Lukashenko, F, gathered all those involved and asked Chichu Hadan, 
Mikhail Nikolaevich, why are you dragging it out? Be honest and direct about what you disagree with, Chichar says, Alexander Grigoryevich, we are talking about people, the unemployed will appear, they will take to the square, Lukashenko cut him off, you, Mikhail Nikolaevich, work, the rest is not your concern, here, on the square, no one will pass, tanks and machine guns will stand here, and not a single one will set foot here, the area will be free. You can do whatever you want 161, as we can see, the determination to defend the reforms even with tanks and machine guns was proclaimed, this instilled hopes in the associates that the turn to the market would be inevitable, but here another and quite crushing surprise awaited all of us, fake in November 1994. Lukashenko went on his first short vacation and flew to Sochi for treatment, even the president has the right to an attack of Shiatika, despite the fact that Leonid Sinitz incorrectly called it pinching of the spinal nerve, at that time, the government, in accordance with the program approved by the president and coordinated with the Supreme Council, was to release prices for dairy products, which was done. On November 11, the president contacted Sinitsin and said that he was returning to Minsk today. In sharp tones, he described to the head of the administration how badly the government works without a head of state. Immediately, I was instructed to write the text of the presidential speech on television and to provide this speech live on the evening of the same day. I wrote the text within an hour. Conceptually, it was defined by the president himself, the speech should be sharply critical, understood, understood, what is there not to understand, therefore, Sinitsin, having received the first version of the text for approval, saw in it shameless abuse of the government and suggested that I not initiate a government crisis, therefore, the final version, which was to be read to the president, was smoothed down so much that the highest officials of the state, waiting at the airport for Lukashenko's arrival, read the printed text and, making sure that it almost did not affect each of them personally, breathed a sigh of relief. The relief was premature, the president who got off the plane looked tired and gloomy, it was felt that acceleration would still be, having taken the text, Lukashenko said goodbye until the evening and left for the residence, at 20.30 he arrived at the television center on Krasnaya Street, his mood was worse than ever, sitting in the makeup chair. Looking at him with loving eyes, he casually returned the text of his own speech to me with the wording, compare, comparison shocked not only me, but everyone who was in the director's cabin, during the 30 minutes that have passed since the start of the news release, the president accused the government, the National Bank, and the Supreme Council of unprofessionalism and pursuing a de facto anti-people policy, the activities of parties and movements, trade unions and the press were assessed as subversive. It was announced directly on the air that tomorrow at 12.00 an expanded meeting of the Cabinet of Ministers will be held, which will be broadcast on television and radio. The Prime Minister and the head of the administration will have to make reports at it. After that, the perpetrators of the anti-popular policy will be punished, and the prices of basic foodstuffs will be returned to their previous level, and they will not rise again. The president guaranteed this with his word of honor 162, one of the Russian television men, who was in the same director's cabin as I, asked if they would be allowed to attend a government meeting, in response, I asked him not to disgrace us before the world, although I understood the senselessness of such a request, there was nowhere else to go, it was a real setup, demand decisiveness from the government in carrying out market reforms and, after the very first step, expose it as an enemy of the people, publicly taking it out like a naughty puppy, 
rushing from the television center to the government house, I expected to find Sinitsin there, Sinitsin was not in his office, the guard, who was standing on the third floor of the presidential wing of the government house, reported that the head of the prime minister, but in the waiting room of Chichi, one of the assistants to the chairman of the government blocked my way, is Sinitsin there, report to Sinitsin, it is forbidden, why impossible became clear only after three hours, Leonid Sinitsin left the office, courageously grabbed my elbow and said with noticeable effort, let's go as it turned out later, the idea to go to the prime minister with a bottle of cognac at the 10th minute of the presidential television improvisation was visited not only by Leonid Sinitsin, without saying a word, at that moment almost all the leadership of the government met in the waiting room of Mikhail Chichir, although Sinitsin was the first to leave, and therefore I did not see the state of the other leaders of the Belarusian state, everyone's mood was not that mournful, but, I would say, catastrophic, everyone was preparing for resignation, the president's speech could mean only one thing, the end of market reforms in Belarus, but there was no resignation, by agreement with Sinitsin, we did not organize a live broadcast of the breakdown planned the day before, and yes, there was no breakdown, the meeting of the government was reduced to the fact that the president was explained, in fact, what he demanded is being done, and everything was limited to a showdown with the prices of cottage cheese and a reprimand for arbitrariness to the Minister of Agriculture and Food. All this noise was only for the public recalls Vasily Leonov, but in fact he understood very well that without price releases, you can't make any reforms. An important role was played by the chairman of the Minsk City Executive Committee Vladimir Yermoshin 163, at that disassembly, he got up and said fearlessly, Alexander Grigoryevich, let me speak as the main customer and consumer of agricultural products, you are wrong here, in this short time, our range of food has seriously expanded, the quality of products has improved, and what the minister did, points to me, aimed at making it even better, if we cancel everything now, return what was, it will be worse, the president even hesitated, during the flight home, they set him up, convinced that mass demonstrations were about to go to the residents demanding his overthrow, and then the mayor of the Belarusian capital stands up and claims that it has become much better than it was, after a pause, the president said, I promised the people to return the prices back, return at least to cottage cheese for a few days, the president cannot deceive his people 164, thus, for the first time, the interests of the Belarusian economy and the populist foundations of Alexander Lukashenko's worldview came into conflict, at that moment, the economy seemed to have won, the government then still found the strength to resist. In addition to mayor of the Belarusian capital Vladimir Yermoshin and minister of agriculture Vasily Leonov, prime minister Mikhail Chichir, deputy prime ministers Mikhail Myosnikovich and Viktor Guncher, head of the national bank Stanislav Bogdankovich spoke in support of continuing the course of reforms 165. Head of the administration Leonid Sinitsin also reacted negatively to the attempt to revise the principles of the chosen course, another, so what are we going to build, the country really changed, and in one day, it is November 11, 1994, the day the president returns from Sochi, that becomes the first milestone on the way of Alexander Lukashenko's refusal from any reform attempts. The fact is that Lukashenko has never been a market reformer in the depths of his soul, 
and he was a typical Soviet leader who had mastered the basics of the Soviet science of management well, this is still Lenin's position, known to every propagandist of the Soviet times, that the socialist state can be managed as an enterprise 166. Leonid Sinitsin recalls how on the way from Shplov, immediately after the victory in the second round, they discussed a natural topic, they took power, how are we going to steer now, then he clearly sounded the idea that Belarus is a small country, and it should be managed from a single center, in principle, as a good production team. This is clear, Lukashenko had no other managerial experience, except for the experience of managing a small production team of the Gorodets State Farm. The second principle of administrative science is also firmly and ineradicably learned by our hero. The same Sinitsin told me how at the very beginning, after his next memorandum, the president called a meeting to clarify the path destined for the country. Do you know what a market economy is? Do you know how to work in market conditions? Lukashenko asked the members of his first government, and the answer was a resounding no. Do you know what a planned economy is? The answer is an equally resounding yes. Here the president sat, looking at Sinitsin with his characteristic expressiveness. So let's build what we know, Edgeward Idin head of the independent consulting group, recalls how the government behaved, say, in 1995, at that time, he advised the country's leadership through Victor Scheiman, secretary of the Security Council, and Peter Prokopovich, deputy head of the administration, here's what he says, a meeting was held under the president on the advisability of devaluing the Belarusian ruble, the exchange rate of which had previously been mothballed for a whole year, only the cool ones were present, Chichir, Myosnikovich, Shimon, Titenkov, Vinikova, Deputy Minister of Economy Shimov, Prokopovich, assistant to the president of the chapter, and I, a Jew from Namiga. I think it was clear to everyone there that the further deduction by the National Bank of the National Currency Rate would ruin the Belarusian industry, but Lukashenko at that time always declared curbing inflation by any means. My group prepared an analytical note for the president, which justified the need for a sharp devaluation of the ruble, immediately and three times, the president let everyone speak and everyone, confident that coincide with the opinion of the boss, began to ardently assure him that it was like death, to let go of the ruble, nothing and nothing to substantiate, I just flashed, a little more, and we would have reached the idea of U200 BU200 strengthening the wooden one, then Lukashenko gives the floor to me, as if from the security council, and, after listening, stated, we will release the course, this work is coordinated by Prokopovich from the administration and the security council, and looks at me, Edgeward, is there something you want to ask, I'd like to shut up, as whole, and so the atmosphere in the hall was not saturated with the smells of love and mutual understanding, and I take it and blurt out, Alexander Grigoryevich, is this the process of making state decisions? After all, I thought that the administration, the National Bank, and the government also prepared their justifications, and then somehow all the responsibility is placed on my group. I would be very reluctant to set the Security Council up, Lukashenko, without saying a word, got up and left. The others shied away from me like the plague, true, a few days later the president approved in writing several proposals of my group, submitted for his consideration even before the meeting 167, indeed, at first Lukashenko still agreed to listen to his ahas, as he put it, advisers with their cleverness about the market and the objectivity of economic laws, and even supported them pushing the government to reform, 
Why did everyone think that he was absorbing market ideas and learning as he went? He really studied, but I learned differently. What did he learn as soon as he came to power? Lukashenko saw and understood the main thing for himself. Once the market steps taken are irreversible, the market is an element that cannot be controlled by administrative methods familiar to the state farm. Intuition told him that these steps were fatal for him. The market, as soon as you enter it, inevitably induces society to democratic transformations. So it turned out that the president's hopes for reforms that could pull the economy out of failure were replaced by an intuitive, animal fear of the absolute. From the point of view of the former director of the state farm, Soviet economy, uncontrollability of market relations, the market and democracy, which could not be controlled, seemed to him inevitably leading to the loss of power. After all, if something does not depend on Alexander Lukashenko, then he, Alexander Lukashenko, has no power over it, and he went precisely for power, intending to come in earnest and for a long time as he once said in an interview, but not only this is important here, motives are always interesting and important, for example, why did Lukashenko need to set up his government in such a way? publicly exposing it as anti-people, it could have been otherwise, but Lukashenko could not and did not want to do otherwise, he couldn't suddenly give up his attitudes, he wasn't used to overturning his own decisions at all, and if you still had to retreat, then the best thing to do is to shift the blame on someone, find a scapegoat, but is it only in the ambitious character, in the inability to admit mistakes, was there another goal, I am convinced, and all subsequent events, even the entire presidential path of Lukashenko convince me of this, that the goal, quite frankly expressed, our hero had, he simply needed to lower the government, just like Bulakhov, Guncha, and then all the rest of the former team, and in the new team, all these wise men had to be immediately broken, indicating their place to them, the only one from the government who was not immediately satisfied with this was Viktor Guncha, who resigned just a week after the memorable meeting of the government. I remember my conversation with him in mid-November of the same 1994, even before his resignation, Potter said, the government was ready to leave if Alexander Grigoryevich refused market reforms. In conversations in his office, he suspected that he was being tapped, but he spoke with everyone with whom he was not personally close. Only in his office, Guncha called the president either by position or by his first and middle name. I asked again, oh, and my Osnikovich, the potter smiled, and why did you ask about my Osnikovich? Because even if my Osnikovich is ready to leave, then this is really serious 168, and my Osnikovich Guncha said after a pause, but in vain he comforted himself with such illusions, Guncha retired alone, this happened in early December, a little over a week after our conversation with him, chapter 3, fixing in positions obediently flexible vertical having not yet subjugated the government, but having already shown who was the boss in the house, it was necessary to strengthen their powers of authority, to reserve the right to unilaterally adjust the political and economic course, and for this, first of all, to acquire the possibility of complete control over the entire system of executive power, and one of the first draft laws submitted by the presidential administration to the session of the Supreme Council is the draft amendments and additions to the law on local self-government. So far, local leaders have been relatively independent of the central government. Coordination with the center is a theme of the past, although they were not elected to their positions by the population of the regions, they were necessarily deputies of local councils. Legally, this provided them with the status of immunity, 
and they had practically no accountability to the president, Lukashenko, as a former director of a state farm and the deputy of the district council, knew firsthand how much power any chairman of the executive committee has, that is why at a press conference on the eve of the decisive session of the Supreme Council, Lukashenko announced that he would insist on creating a power vertical subordinate to the president, if the parliament opposes this, it will be forced to appoint its own representatives to the chairman of the executive committees in parallel, and then the old structures will turn into unnecessary appendages 169, he really insisted and the Supreme Council made the corresponding decision, thus, the creation of a vertical of executive power began in the Republic, practically not subordinate to anyone except the President, some of the deputies of the Supreme Council immediately realized what a powerful lever they had transferred into the hands of a recent colleague, a group of parliamentarians appealed to the Constitutional Court with a request to consider the issue of the conformity of the new law with the Constitution, and this appeal, although formally the Supreme Council was the respondent, was the first real clash between the President of Belarus and other branches of power in the country. The collision is described by Judge Mikhail Pastokhov. We saw that these changes are contrary to the Constitution, that in fact we are talking about the destruction of local self-government, since the chairman of the district executive committees should be appointed by the president, we, as conscientious lawyers, unanimously, by a majority of votes, spoke in favor of the proposal to suspend the operation of this law, Alexander Grigoryevich at that time was resting in Sochi, to our surprise, he interrupted his vacation and arrived in Minsk, the first meeting of the Constitutional Court with the President took place right there, he came to our court, this was the first and last time he was in court, with Sinitsin, Guncher and guards, well guys, what are you doing, I have to raise the state from the ruins, I need solid power, I need a lever with which I can raise it all, and you put spokes in my wheels, I voted for each of you, you seem to be all yours, boys, what are you, such is the friendly conversation, without any threats, just a conversation, we even took pictures at the end, at the end of the meeting, Valery Gurevich Tikinia, on behalf of the court, said that we would no longer cancel our decision to suspend the law, but would try to immediately, within a week, if I'm not mistaken, consider this case, and so the Constitutional Court concludes that it cannot say for sure whether these provisions of the law and the introduction of a vertical of executive power contradict the Constitution or do not contradict although it is absolutely clear that they contradict, but the judges did not want to spoil relations with the president, and with such a conclusion, they actually raised the barrier for the presidential vertical 170, thus, the first step in the direction from democracy to authoritarianism was made, true, the country will feel its consequences only in two years, it would be necessary to lower the Supreme Soviet at first, President Lukashenko had no reason to complain about any disloyalty on the part of state structures, his victory in 1994 was honest and therefore impressive, even the Belarusian People's Front was forced to admit this, the uncompromising Zinan Pozniak himself congratulated him with a telegram on his election, and the parliamentary opposition also intended to behave towards the first popularly elected leader of the country, as they say, like a gentleman, Valentina Trigubovich recalls, the president was given a hundred days to figure it out and form a team, it was decided not to attack him during these hundred days, and they didn't attack. Another thing is that Lukashenko himself could not come to terms with the attitude of the deputies of parliament towards him, 
not the Supreme Council as an institution, but each parliamentarian individually, the majority of the elite, both the Council of Ministers and the Parliamentary one, did not perceive the words President and Lukashenko, well, in any way says Valentin Golubov, the position was respected, and Lukashenko was treated like Sashka, who constantly ran into cabbage, and no one understood the meaning of the speeches, journalists used to come up to him and ask, tell me what you wanted to say, he was at a loss, did not know how to say in three sentences what he wanted to say to the Supreme Council, Lukashenko's victory was a shock for the deputies, because they did not take him seriously, believing that he was inferior to them in terms of intelligence, human and moral qualities, and so on until the repression began 171, but now, when the Supreme Council and the Constitutional Court almost came into contact, Lukashenko realized that the danger lies not so much in persons as in the institutions of state power, more precisely, in the delineation of powers of the branches of power provided for by the Constitution. He thought that he had enough of his royal powers, but it turns out that they are limited by the legislative and judicial authorities, a classic collision from Alexei Tolstoy and his hero, Tsar Fyodor Ionovich, asking, am I a king or not a king, turns out he's not a king, or rather, not quite a king. This is very difficult to come to terms with, because if not quite the king, someone else may easily have a desire to try on the Monomax hat, and in order to completely eradicate the prospect of such encroachments, it was first necessary to deal with possible sources of their financing, dealt with bankers we remember that in August-September 1994 the President proposed and the Parliament approved the program of urgent measures to reform the economy, the program was purely a compromise, one might say, the child of an agreement between the marketers and the socialists who had entrenched themselves in the government. The operational management of this trench was carried out by Prime Minister Mikhail Chichar, who at that time fluctuated along with the line of the president, but there was another trench, the National Bank, Professor Stanislav Bogdankovich commanded here, who was not going to hesitate, since he had nothing to lose. He knew why the president did not immediately replace him, if the professor copes with inflation, thanks, if he doesn't cope, there will be someone to make a scapegoat, but Bogdankovich could not stop inflation, at best, it was possible to slow down the growth of the dollar against the Belarusian ruble, which he did by the end of the winter of 1995, the course stopped, so much so that the Belarusian economy began to choke, the products of Belarusian industrial giants intended for export sales began to rise in price not in bunnies, but in dollars, which made them uncompetitive, Bogdankovich, of course, could not fail to understand all this, but he had to comply with the requirements of the authorities, after all, he was just an official responsible for his own, very specific, items in the presidential program, he performed them, and the country's chief banker was not to blame for the fact that the government did not fulfill its points, there was, however, another point of view, Tamara Vinikova, the head of Belarus Bank, the largest at that time, adhered to it, she was an outstanding strong-willed woman, masculinely ambitious, Bogdankovich's policy did not suit her, as it led to an extremely undesirable result for banks, the banking sector remained the only profitable sector of the Belarusian economy, and therefore a real threat of dispossession hung over it, and although in politics Bogdankovich was a democrat, but as a bank manager he adhered to completely state, even authoritarian methods, this is how any banker would behave in his place, including Vinikova, but at that moment they were each in their place, 
and therefore the war between them was inevitable. Each defended his interests. Lukashenko quickly realized that Bogdankovich only literally fulfilled his demand. He stopped the growth of the dollar, one of the inflation indices. To stop inflation, in the first place, the rise in prices for basic goods and services was possible only as a result of a decisive reform of the Belarusian economy as a whole, but the reform meant denationalization, the rejection of administrative methods of managing the economy, and the president, as already mentioned, was not ready for this, for him. The rejection of administrative methods of management was tantamount to a renunciation of power, and then he resorted to the old method, known almost from the time of King Hamrabi. He pitted the two most influential bankers of the country against each other, to, watching the fight, extract rational grains for themselves, and then remove the other with the hands of one of the opponents. Here is what Tamara Vinikova writes in her memoir letters especially for our book. The president began to personally address all the mail to me with questions that were within the competence of the National Bank. My apparatus and I simply drowned in the flow of questions and the preparation of options for solving this or that problem. At the same time, this was a slap in the face for Bogdankovich. Then Bogdankovich sent another huge batch of inspectors to us. The bank team was suffocating. Many remained at work for days, began to quit. My working day ended at 2 3 am, and at 8 9 am I was already at work. At one of the meetings with the president, I started a conversation about the issue of the competence of the National Bank being decided by its staff. 500 people of the staff only in the main office. He slyly smiled into his mustache and said that if it is difficult to cope with volumes, it is necessary to go to the National Bank and the problems will be solved. Taking advantage of this conversation, I suggested that he look at several candidates for this post, two of them were cadres from Moscow, well known to him and worthy professionals, he agreed, but instructed me to conduct all the preliminary negotiations, which I actively engaged in. But Bogdankovich had powerful allies in the power structures. The government was headed by Mikhail Chich, the presidential administration, by Leonid Sinitsin. Neither the first nor the second had any particular sympathy for Vinikova. Chich, due to his own banking past, Sinitsin, Leonid Sinitsin recalls, when she appeared and began to openly lie at meetings, it was a shock for me. The merger of banks, the disappearance of banks, it was absolutely clear to me for what purpose this was being done, and I told her about it, this began our conflict, although outwardly we were friendly, and after a while I treat her as a human being very well, Vinikova seems to answer him, Bogdankovich understood that his days were numbered, the president has openly ignored him. But Sinitsin had personal material sympathies for Bogdankovich and volunteered to settle these issues. On his initiative, several meetings were held with the president, where the reasons for our disagreements were clarified, including on options for solving economic problems in the country. There were no tears, no fainting, as some articles wrote. On the contrary, the joint consideration of some projects where our opinions differed showed that my arguments were calculated to the smallest detail, the president gave preference to them, and later life itself proved their worth, Sinitsin is not a fool, he was the first to understand that they would not be able to just throw me off the bill. One can, of course, only guess what Sinitsin means when he says that Vinikova blatantly lied, and what Vinikova herself hints at when she speaks of Sinitsin's personal material sympathies for Bogdankovich. In any case, they represented different banking clans, each defending their own interests. At the same time, the marketer Bogdankovich advocated the idea of tighter control over commercial banks, and Vinikova, 
whose bank was created at one time under the patronage of the government, was forced to fight for the weakening of the state news thrown around her neck, but back to the plot of the war, so, Sinitsin achieved the exclusive right to examine the memorandums submitted by the informal advisor to the president, Tamara Vinikova. For me Tamara Dmitrievna recalls, these were dark days, in all senses, because there were specific people, companies and money behind the projects, it all ended with the fact that when the project was rejected, my name was indicated to all those who were dissatisfied, for example, I will give a project that was prepared by Kilco 172 is a project to transfer all the country's cash flows to Sberbank. Sberbank would have to take the money purse of the government and its Ministry of Finance, the National Bank, etc. In addition, the local authorities had to report to Kilco on the use of funds. It should be noted that by that time Sberbank was bankrupt. 85% of foreign exchange funds were used so that it was impossible to return them. I was against this option. But at the same time, there was another option for saving Sberbank, Tamara Vinikova continues, Bogdankovich made a proposal to merge Sberbank with Stroybank and thus save it, at the same time, he solved two problems, the elimination of Rakov, the head of Bilprom's Troy Bank, F, they were bitter rivals, and the closing of the debt, since the main exporters and, therefore, currency holders are clients of this bank. After listening to the two sides, Lukashenko proposed a third option, his own. Vinikova says, by that time, the president hardly believed anyone. The special services informed him that the privatization scheme through the system of planned bankruptcies in Moscow was gaining momentum, and the Sberbank of our republic was a quite possible victim. He invited me familiarized me with the proposals of Bogdankovich and said that he decided to merge with Sberbank not Proms Troy Bank, but Belarus Bank 173. When I told the bank owners about this, they were shocked. Personnel had already been recruited, the construction of luxurious offices was being completed, on the security of which it was possible to obtain a loan in any domestic and foreign bank, there was a solid fleet of top-class cars for personnel and transportation of valuables, the credit lines of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development have already worked, everything collapsed and most importantly, the independence of the bank was lost, the founders of the bank refused, and I personally informed the president about it, he ordered a meeting and put the issue to a vote, as provided by the law, asked those who were against to remain in the hall, he would personally come and talk about the importance of reunification, there were no owners of capital who wanted to have a personal conversation with the president, the decision to merge was made almost unanimously, the loser Bogdankovich had no choice but to resign, he resigned from the post of chairman of the board of the National Bank even without following the proper procedure, after all, his appointment was approved by the Supreme Council, he should have accepted the resignation, but the Supreme Council was no longer up to Bogdankovich. Chapter 4, Farewell, Freedom of Speech, he won't forgive them these tears. The second anti-corruption report was being prepared, a former member of the Parliamentary Commission on Corruption, the same one, Lukashenkos, a former worker of one of the Minsk factories, a member of the BPF opposition Sergei Antonchik, who dreamed of becoming a Belarus and Walesa, was going to speak with him. Antonchik was sure that the trump card in the fight against corruption had not yet been played, he did not feel the changed situation and the atmosphere in society was no longer the same as a year ago, the deputy of the Supreme Council of the 12th Convocation Valentin Golubov recalls, Pozniak told Antonchik, don't, 
and Sergey has already beaten the beat, he says, this is my personal report, and not the BPF opposition, and in the press it also went like a report by Deputy Antonchik, it was impossible to stop Antonchik. Lukashenko set a too seductive example, it seemed to many that now every public whistleblower would be able to come to power, the report was dedicated to the anniversary of the anti-corruption speech of Lukashenko himself, Golubov continues, the atmosphere was very close to what it was during Lukashenko's report, although the second time is not the first, but there was another intrigue, could Antonchik break Lukashenko? Lukashenko had no facts with real confirmation when he spoke, and Antonchik cited down whole facts, with links, and when, a few minutes after the beginning of the speech, Lukashenko, sitting in a special place of the president, on his podium, covered his face with his hands and began to cry, everyone had the impression that everything was a pipe to him, for example, I felt sorry for Lukashenko, I think, well, how is it, well, he robbed someone, but why is he being robbed like that now, still, whether you love him or not, he is the president, I do not presume to say that Lukashenko was crying at that moment, perhaps he just did not want to see and hear all this, when he gave a report a year ago, he probably seemed to himself a hero who crushed evil, and who did he seem to himself now, a wolf in a kennel, despite the fact that the audience did not whistle, did not hoot, but simply watched him attentively, and Sergei Antonchik accused, he accused Lukashenko of the main thing, he appointed corrupt officials to the highest government posts, allegedly knowing that they were corrupt officials, Antonchik's report showed the role of Balagropram Bank in promoting inflation and money laundering, a blow to Prime Minister Chijr, the Chernobyl Heritage Foundation, a number of enterprises associated with it, were accused of laundering money allocated for the liquidation of the consequences of the Chernobyl accident, a blow to the President's affairs manager Titankov, they also spoke about the patronage of persons who were selling off army property on the cheap, Defense Minister Kosenko, finally, the head of the presidential administration, Leonid Sinitsin, whose son is studying in the United States on the money of Joseph Leviton, who allegedly financed Lukashenko's election campaign, was also hit, and so on plus little things, akin to the facts in last year's report 174 Lukashenko covered his face with his hands and waited for the end, still, he was by nature a talented playwright improviser, actor and director, the chairman Michi Zohri announced a break, after a break, one after another, the officials named in the report began to approach the rostrum and announce their resignations, the first is the head of the administration, Leonid Sinitsin, then the manager of affairs Ivan Titenkov, the head of the control service Vasily Dolgolev 175, in my opinion, of the high officials mentioned in the report at that time, only Mikhail Chichir, the prime minister, and defense minister Anatoly Kosenko did not announce their readiness to leave their post, confusion reigned in the hall. Does it mean that Lukashenko is not to blame for anything, and he simply did not know anything about all the affairs of his subordinates, stop, and are they guilty, or just offended and outraged by the slander, you never know what the speaker piled up here, nothing has happened yet, but the situation has begun to change, Valentin Golubov recalls, I don't know how Lukashenko spoke with Sinitsin, with Titankov during the break, but the break passed and everything changed, and after Viktor Kaczynski said about the grenade launcher, presidential aide Viktor Kaczynski said at that moment that he was ready to defend the president with a grenade launcher in his hands, a, f, that's all, suddenly there was a turning point, there was no one to attack, one Antonchik attacked, 
The opposition did not go in support of Antonchik. Everyone looked at what was happening as if it were just another game, and I don't know if Lukashenko managed to talk to Sinitsin, but I remember well how Sinitsin called me with a look and said, Sasha, prepare a text for me for a minute and a half, I'm resigning, and, seeing my confusion, is it really true, he only squeezed my elbow, shut up. The rest of the crossbows wrote statements, having understood Sinitsin's maneuver, when Sinitsin was already going to the podium, Valentin Golubev is right, there was no one to attack, both the parliament and the people are tired of revelations, MP Golubev is echoed by MP Leonidko, Lukashenko was absolutely organic in his last year's report, and Antonchik all this was already secondary, Antonchik's facts were really serious, credible and strong in content, but society, it seems to me, was already beginning to get fed up with such information, the stage when people gained political popularity on the wave of revelations of the regime has already been worked out. The Supreme Council took the only decision regarding the report of Sergei Antonchik to send its text and the documents attached to it to the prosecutor's office, so that the prosecutor's office would evaluate the facts presented in it. Looking ahead, we can inform the reader that this venerable department, headed by the then Prosecutor General Vasily Shalidinov, made a Solomon decision. The prosecutor's office will not find any signs of an offense in the facts mentioned by Deputy Sergei Antonchik 176. Of course, none of those who went to the podium and publicly resigned did not leave the post. What cannot be said about the author of these lines, for this time I had to be the scapegoat. Blank spots in newspapers in the evening, a presidential reception for diplomats and the press was to take place on the occasion of the upcoming Christmas. In the morning, the president was leaving for an official visit to Tashkent, and I was supposed to accompany him. Unexpectedly, they are called to the reception room of the head of state. Lukashenko met me already on the threshold, leaving the office, do whatever you want, but the report must not be printed, I began to say that this would be perceived as a violation of the freedom of speech guaranteed by the constitution, immediately offered to print a report with a preface, published at the direction of the president of the Republic of Belarus I mumbled something else, but the president was firm, I don't give up my people, do as you please, but the report must not be printed. I returned to the office and called the director of the Belarus and press house Boris Kutavoy, please, in case any newspaper publishes this damn report, let me know, he just sighed into the phone. Alexander Yosefovich, the switchman, it turns out, I will be again, after all, you will then deny that you called me, I understand, don't worry, Boris Alexandrovich, I promise to confirm the fact of our conversation publicly, the chief editors of the four leading state newspapers, Iosif Seredik, Nikolai Kurnoga, Vladimir Narkovich and Igor Osinsky, were also at the Christmas reception, I asked them to refrain from publishing the report of Sergei Antonchik, arguing that there is no need to shame people ahead of time, running into lawsuits for the protection of honor and dignity, I remember the look of the editor of Zvezda, Narkovich, full of inescapable anguish, why then published the previous report, Iosif Seredik, who headed the parliamentary Narodna Gazeta and was a deputy of the Supreme Council, and therefore considered himself more free to act, asked if it was still possible to print a report with the comment that the facts presented in it needed to be verified. I replied, I can't legally ban it, I can only ask, I really don't want it to happen that we're leaving tomorrow and you're typing the report. One of the editors sighed and said, let's assume we've agreed, the editor of Sovetskaya Belrussia, Igor Osinsky, 
was silent, and in the morning I flew to Uzbekistan, before the solemn reception, it was the end of the second day of the official visit of the President of the Republic of Belarus to Uzbekistan, Slava Zankovic, head of the Belarusian Bureau of Interfax, approached me, listen, Yosefovic, we have some kind of booze there in Minsk, newspapers came out with blank spots, how is it, with white spots, I immediately rushed to call Minsk, Sinitsin, don't worry, it's all right he said with forced cheerfulness, it's okay, well, the deputies began to buzz, they will poke, and stop, how are you doing there, in Tashkent, I started calling my office, the situation, as I expected, was far from rosy, it turns out that instead of Antonchik's report, Soviet Belarus was the first to come out with white spots, with its half a million copies, the next day, all four major state newspapers came out with blank spots, the parliamentary opposition will raise the issue of freedom of speech, the introduction of censorship and the possible impeachment of the head of state, the head of state, passing to the gangway of the plane, we flew to Samarkand, looked at me disapprovingly, well, what do you have there, nothing, I have nothing, we have problems, but Lukashenko himself did not think so, after all, he personally did not give any orders to anyone, is it possible to consider as an order a phrase thrown on the fly, do as you know, as I expected, Sinitsin only pretended that everything was in order, the idea of impeachment was indeed in the air, newspapers were literally teeming with headlines, from which it followed that there was a violation of the Constitution 177, but what impressed me the most was the white, no, not spots, but whole newspaper pages, I had to do something drastic, these white pages put an end to my own reputation, and then I informed my subordinates that I intended to resign, due to the fact that my actions caused political damage to the head of state, they looked at me, with my idiotic nobility, as if I were a holy fool, Sinitsin looked at me in exactly the same way, to whom I informed him of my decision, I kept telling him something that if I didn't cover up the head of state by taking the blame for what happened on myself, then the case could end with the impeachment of our president, Sinitsin looked me up and down, and the conviction that I was crazy was clearly growing in him with every minute 178. Well, according to the labor code, I cannot fire you for another month, and we'll see, on that they parted, I returned to the office and called Narkovich at Zvezda, Vladimir Bronislavovich, send me someone more intelligent, preferably right now, are you going to retire, Alexander Yosefovich, Narkovich guest, do not do that, everyone will only get worse, Nevertheless, Narkovich nevertheless sent a correspondent, the next morning, information about my possible resignation had already been circulated, taking responsibility for everything that happened, I knew that in the story with the appearance of blank spots in Soviet Belarus there was still a background that was completely beyond my control. The fact is that the editorial office of the newspaper Sovetskaya Belarusia has been checking the control service of the president for a month. Some abuses were allegedly revealed up to large financial scams. I can't say whether it was real or not, but the editor-in-chief of the newspaper Igor Osinski understood that he was doomed. Moreover, he was doomed for the same reason that Guncha, Bulakhov, Sinitsin and many other members of the team were doomed, it was so that Sky about Russia that more actively than other state newspapers promoted the activities of the future president of the country, being the first to publish both the text of his notorious report and a huge interview with him, thus, Alexander Lukashenko knew the power of this newspaper, Russian language, and therefore influencing precisely his electorate, so, he had to subdue her, 
First of all, depriving the staff of the status of co-founder of the newspaper, realizing that he had no prospect of reaching an agreement with the head of state, Osipsky chose the offensive tactics of self-defense, with a daring and very witty move with white spots, he tried to turn his case from an administrative criminal one, which they began to solve for him, into a political one, after that everything was simple, the case really turned into a political one, Osipsky himself figured for some time as a victim of the struggle for Glasnost, and Lukashenko and the press quarreled forever, that's probably all, I had no intention of resigning, I still hoped that the president would realize that he had made a mistake by forbidding the publication of this report that had changed nothing and, in fact, did not interfere with anyone, but Lukashenko knew only too well what he wanted, I was convinced of this on the morning of January 2, 1995, when I came to work. Boris Kutovoy, director of the Belarusian press house, sat in the reception room, well, Alexander Yosefovich, who are we expelling, the chief printer of the Republic asked me, feigning efficiency, how, we expel, what do you think, Boris Alexandrovich, one scandal is not enough, he took out a list from a folder and put it in front of me, here, this is a list of those publications that are printed in our BDP, C, 4 crossed out, he crossed it out, from the horror that flashed in the eyes of Kutavoy I realized that he did not mean Titankov at all, it is said that you must name four more newspapers, the following items were crossed out, Belruskaya Delova Gazeta, Femus, Svoboda and Andrei Klimov's newspaper, it was these publications that annoyed the head of state the most, I picked up the list, threw it over my shoulder, wait, and ran to the third floor, to Sinitsin, Sinitsin was not in the know, the story with the white spots already caused him a state of shock, no matter how brave he was, after listening to me, he became completely gloomy, after a long silence, he finally asked, and what do you propose to do, go to him, explain, this is no longer a mistake, this is the final destruction of my reputation, I can't explain it to him, but I don't want to be a scapegoat either, help, you are more comfortable, besides, he will listen to you, well, I took on the white spots, but the second time on the same rake a week later, you can still take on a mistake, but stupidity, thank you, what do you want, let him cancel the order, and we went to the reception room of the head of state, the president was there, Sinitsin took the handle of the office door, looked at me, let's go together, go alone, you were with him 179, an hour later, Ivan Titenkov looked into the waiting room, who is the boss, Sinitsin, Ah, well, I'll come into Titankov disappeared behind the door, a minute later, the enraged head of the administration flew out of there, went, Sinitsin literally broke into his own office, went into the restroom, took cognac from the safe and, without asking, poured two glasses halfway, I almost convinced him, but then came Ivan, that's how Ivan says, so be it, and take this one and blurt out, why is Faduta spitting out, let him go and carry out the order, hurt, so tell them, let him go and carry out the order, consider what was passed, do you have my application, just a week ago, I accepted in good faith the responsibility for the president's mistake, asking one thing in return, before making such a decision, call and listen, and then decide, it's your right, and here again, now this was already a real betrayal on his part, so, you need to leave, and I left, and I do not blame either the president or myself for my own resignation, 
we both did the right thing, everyone is in their own way, I, because after everything that happened, I could not remain in my previous position, it didn't even make sense for the cause, and the president, he needed attendants, not associates, Lukashenko was not interested in my principles or my ideas about freedom of speech, one could, of course, obey Sinitsin and sit out a deputy mandate, but I've had enough, I could not approve of either the story with the blank spots or the subsequent dismissal of the chief editors of the newspapers, against all laws 118 or the expulsion of non-state newspapers from printing houses, and later from the state distribution system 181, in addition, the motives of Lukashenko's behavior were too clear to me, what's so difficult, after Sergei Antonchik tried to turn against the president the weapon so well known to him, the fight against corruption, Lukashenko realized that in the same way someone would one day decide to use the second weapon against him, Glasnost, he managed to prudently take away television from potential opponents, putting people loyal to him in leading positions on the board, and as soon as he came to power, he managed to cancel the live broadcast of the sessions, despite even the threats of deputies to appeal to the prosecutor's office, the sessions were not broadcast on television or radio, and no one heard or saw deputy Antonchik, why all the action in the Oval Hall remained purely chamber and only echoes outside it, the queue reached the newspapers, of course, newspapers were not as powerful weapons as TV or radio, but nevertheless, there is an article in the newspaper, there is a problem, no article, there is no problem, he went to the scandal with blank spots because he was sure that any scandal is still less dangerous than the content of the report and it was necessary to make sure that there were no articles objectionable to him in the state press, never, and he achieved it. The society was divided into readers of different newspapers and viewers of different TV channels, Moscow's and TV culture were then still broadcast in the Republic, probably, such a division would have happened without Lukashenko's active pressure, but gradually, and he was not going to wait, and divided society immediately, the few readers of the democratic press have stopped reading the state press, Belarus and state television with its bare and sugary propaganda was stopped by 90% of opposition supporters, but now the entire power of Lukashenko's propaganda has fallen upon the electorate, with constant television and radio broadcasting, huge circulations of official newspapers, it was precisely for this, and not at all because of the opinion of some Titankov, that the president did not listen to Sinitsin at that time, he knew all too well what he was after, he came to power because society was split, and he intended to govern precisely a split society, it was a matter of small things, it remained to bring the opposition to its knees, to destroy it morally, chapter 5, disposal you never know what you can do till you try the idea of holding the first referendum in the history of Belarus probably came to Lukashenko immediately after the report of Sergei Antonchik, for all his independence, the intrigues of the Belarus and popular front, of which he was and remained an activist, were clearly visible here, and since it was in the popular front that Lukashenko saw the main threat of potential unrest, he needed to put an end to the political influence of the Belarus and popular front once and for all, this could be done only by chopping the sprouts of unrest to the root, depriving the enemy of his main conquests, the Belarus and popular front had only two conquests, the adoption of historical Belarus and symbols in the state and the recognition of the Belarus and language as the state language, this should have been taken away, and it was at the referendum, demonstrating once again that the people do not support the opposition, but Lukashenko, therefore, when on March 16, 
1995, a large group of deputies of the Supreme Council, appropriately prepared by the head of the administration Leonid Sinitsin, turned to the president with a proposal to hold a referendum on new symbols and giving the Russian language the status of a state language. This initiative was warmly accepted and supported by Lukashenko. It was impossible to think of a better reason for a fight with the opposition. Moreover, the question of people's support for the foreign policy and economic course of the head of state could also be raised for company. It remained to come up with a new coat of arms and flag, instead of the ancient Belarus and Pahonia 182 and the white red white banner. The social order for the development of new symbols was defined as follows. The society was mostly focused on the old flag and coat of arms recalls Sinitsin, old, in this context, red, Soviet, they acted simply with the flag, they removed the hammer and sickle from the former flag of the BSSR and slightly updated the style of the ornament, with the coat of arms, of course, it is more difficult, but, as they say, the eyes are afraid, the hands are doing, Leonid Sinitsin. I sat down and drew, even though I'm not an artist, and then the artist designed everything in colors, they arranged a kind of competition, someone brought with a stork, someone else brought something, I don't remember, but when they put everything out, Lukashenko took my sketches for the main ones, this is ours, therefore I can't get away from authorship here, Valentin Golubov recalls. Sinitsin told me how they bungled the coat of arms, at Vladika Filarate 183 was his birthday, he invited the president and the team to his place for lunch, when they came from there, the mood was upbeat, they drank a little there, put the computer scientists in, well, how are we going to make a coat of arms, and let's take the coat of arms of the Soviet Union or the Belarus and SSR as a basis, they took it once, changed it, removed it, cleaned it, did it, and here is the coat of arms, and they showed me what happened, I say, there can be no such coat of arms, maybe, and it will be adopted, and we will put it to a referendum. The obvious handicraft of our main state symbols submitted for nationwide approval still jars many, and an incomprehensible hole with the contours of Belarus over the globe, and the red, above, with the green, below, flag, soon nicknamed by the wits a sunset over a swamp, but let's leave that, it's not about heraldry. Because if you remember why it was necessary to change the symbolism at all, then it is clear that the worse it turned out, the more protest it caused, the better. After all, her replacement was only a provocative attack, and only one in a combination of several blows at once, an act of desperation the new symbolism and bilingualism were supposed to provoke Zinan Pozniak and his team to take decisive action. After all, in front of their eyes, people were offered to abandon the most sacred thing, the centuries-old history of the struggle and suffering of the Belarus and people embodied in the Pagan and the white red white flag, refusing to recognize the Belarus and language as the only state language meant dooming it to a slow and painful death. In order to prevent this, and here Lukashenko calculated everything correctly, the Belarus and Popular Front was ready for any form of protest, Valentin Golubov says, when it became clear that a decision to hold a referendum would still be made on April 12, we gathered in room 367 in the building of the Supreme Council, which was given to the opposition, we were ready for any radical action, but did not know what to do, radicalism was natural, Zion and Pozniak and his associates understood that people who received historical symbols as state symbols less than four years ago can easily agree with its abolition today. After all, for the majority, nothing was connected with these symbols. For two centuries Belarusans were deprived of historical memory, 
and the referendum symbolized the victory of oblivion over history, it was meanness to use it, but Lukashenko did not stop before it, he was clearly guided at that moment not by moral, but by political considerations, therefore, a handful of Benef intellectuals with deputy mandates felt themselves, and in fact they were, the last soldiers of Belarusian history, at the cost of their own lives, they were ready to prevent the referendum, if only the rest would understand what they were offered to refuse, thus, the idea of a hunger strike was born, at night, Pozniak and Antonchik came to me recalls Valentin Golubov, we sat in the kitchen and thought about what to do, and they decided to go on a hunger strike, it was an act of desperation, we agreed that we would arrive in advance, warn the opposition and sympathetic deputies so that they would support what we would do, if they can, on April 11, 1995, the Supreme Council began to discuss the issue of the referendum initiated by Lukashenko, the bulletin formulated four questions, about changing the state emblem and flag in accordance with the sketches presented by the President, about giving the status of the state language to Russian, about supporting the President's course towards economic integration with Russia, and about the possibility of dissolving the Supreme Council in case of gross violation of the Constitution, it was decided that the results of voting on the first three questions would be binding, and on the fourth, advisory 184, it remains only to set a date, and then the opposition begins to act. Pazniak stood up and announced that we are declaring an indefinite hunger strike in the meeting room as a sign of protest against the adoption of the decision on the referendum. It was, of course, a shock. The Supreme Council immediately refused to consider the proposal for a referendum. Many thought, it means that something is wrong with the referendum. If we have taken such an emergency measure, the deputies approached us and expressed their support. It became clear that the Supreme Soviet could cancel the referendum altogether. 185. The opposition demonstrated its moral strength, and this turned it into a center of political attraction. Of course, the attitude of the deputies was far from unequivocal, for some in the hall, this caused stress, others looked at us from the side, as if at some kind of performance, many began to shiver from anticipation of how it would all end, and everyone understood that they would not leave us just like that. 186. Commander makes a decision I found out about the deputies' hunger strike in the afternoon recalls Leonid Sinitsin, and literally an hour later he gathered representatives of the special services and asked, what do you think about this, the deputy minister of the interior, I don't remember his last name, said that the building was mined, I asked what they were going to do and got the answer. We will act in this case in accordance with the current non-standard situation, and what does the head of the presidential administration, who was informed about the mine in the building of the government house, do next? Nothing special, as if everything is in order, he is looking forward to the evening, it was beyond my official authority continues Leonid Sinitsin. Ivan Titenkov was in charge of buildings, Viktor Shyman was in charge of security, it was within their jurisdiction, in the evening, I called the president, and we went to the government house, where the presidential services were located at that time 187. We came together with Minister of Defense Kosenko, the deputies were sitting in the Oval Hall, we were sitting in the President's office, and Lukashenko says, the building is mined, what shall we do, how will we free, serious business, deputies anyway, he called Valentin Golitz, commander of the internal troops of the Republic of Belarus, A.F. Golitz came, 
with a stamped stat went into the office, reported in full form, Comrade Commander-in-Chief, arrived at your command, the President says, follow the command to vacate the building, take action and report on the action plan, you have 30 minutes, ago let's reported the evacuation plan to the President in about 30 minutes. Sinitsin's story is supplemented by the first deputy chairman of the KGB, Valery Kass. This was the first action that I carried out on the instructions of the president, Yegrov, the head of the KGB, was on vacation. I could not then object and could not prevent. I was ordered to leave together with the Alpha unit and the internal troops unit under the leadership of the Golets to take part in the expulsion of the deputies. Let us try, on the basis of the testimonies of eyewitnesses and participants, to reconstruct the picture of how the decision of the Commander-in-Chief was carried out. Evacuation Deputy Valentin Golubov recalls, several times we were approached with persuasion, then they announced that there was a bomb in the meeting room, officers and soldiers came with dogs, once they brought people in leather jackets, as we were later told, they were employees of the Belarus and KGB. Tasovitz, head of the main directorate of state security of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, deputy of the Supreme Council, F, told them, take them, get them out of here, we began to explain that we are deputies and we are not just anywhere, but in the hall of the parliament, they listened to us and said to Tasovitz, pick it up and take it out. Around midnight, we all began to settle down, someone in an armchair, someone in sleeping bags, and everyone fell asleep. I was lying near the podium, next to me was Deputy Sergei Nomchik. At first I heard something strange in the air, it's even hard to retell it. The air is swaying when a lot of people are walking, either in formation, or even out of step. But a lot of people, those who served in the army know that even at a distance it can be felt, feels in the air, and then I hear, ding ding, the sound of a carbine from the belt of a Kalashnikov assault rifle on the barrel, this sound cannot be confused, I did not wake anyone up, I went up the central steps and opened the door leading from the meeting room of the Supreme Council to the foyer, it was brightly lit and completely packed with armed men, near the door, not with a machine gun, it seems to me, but with a light machine gun, there was a man who immediately pointed it at my stomach, everyone who stood at the door was with satchels and gas masks, I stepped back and shouted, machine gunners, lights went on in the hall immediately, it became unbearably bright, and three or four people, cameramen with video cameras, began to film everything that was happening, Deputy Leonid Jko says, what happened next was very fast, four doors swung open, and a stream of military personnel poured into the hall, some of them armed and in camouflage uniforms, and some in black suits, which allowed them to be quite mobile, and this stream poured from above, to the right and to the left along the central aisles, and the Black Sunder Commando, it jumped from top to bottom through the seats, they flew in and started dragging us as soon as possible, my colleagues brushed aside, tried to fight back, the number of people in the hall was in the hundreds, everything ended quickly, I still remember showing my id and saying, what are you doing, this is lawlessness, but it was all empty, these people, it seems to me, are exactly like this in terms of their training, their brains are turned off, they are simply given a task, and everything else when performing this task does not interest them, Valentin Golubov continues, at first, Mikhail Tasovitz came to the negotiations, he demanded that we leave, saying that otherwise force would be used, we refused, and as soon as he left, all the doors to the meeting room of the Supreme Council opened in an instant, and a dozen or two people flew in black sports uniforms, black shoes and masks, they flew, jumped, twisted in the air and shouted, 
Kia, I now understand that it was an element of intimidation, and it was really scary, but it was so fast, they flew in, and immediately after them people in glass masks with machine guns entered and stood around the perimeter throughout the hole, these blacks did not reach me, they were few, maybe 10, 15, 20 people, they rushed to the front rows, and Pozniak was sitting in front, they started tearing Pozniak's mouth, poking fingers in his eyes, Germanchuk was next to Pozniak, Germanchuk first beat them, and then he took them and tore off the mask from one of them, after the mask was torn off, the man immediately fell to the floor and covered himself with his hands so that his face could not be seen, our guys, who were ahead, understood, and began to tear off the masks from others, but people were already running without masks, with clubs, I remember we were pulled out together with chairs, when the session started the next day, someone said, maybe it didn't happen, what are you talking about, but who broke these chairs, I was the first to be pulled out of the chair, and two people twisted my arms up so sharply, that I, standing on my feet, hit my head on the floor, at that moment, they hit me with a baton on the spine, and I just stopped feeling my legs, everything was filmed, what Leonid Sinitsin sees on it, many years later he will describe in one word, terrible, then he will add, the impression, of course, was depressing, round hole, and they stand in the corner, as I remember now, the movement of people in masks, remove deputies, screams, noise, such a heavy impression, in life, everything was like in a movie action movie, only instead of terrorists, deputies of the highest legislative body of power, who had the status of immunity, were killed, Leonid Cole recalls, several people for each, they run their hands behind their backs and drag them so that your head was down, and all at a terribly fast pace, I remember well how I was dragged down the marble stairs, there were a lot of people around, Valentin Golubov, the boys, it seems, were in the military service, because some asked, don't worry, we don't want to hurt you, but all the same, my hands were held so that my head was somewhere at the level of my knees, Antonchik was being led next to me, and somewhere nearby, I could not raise my head to see anything, there was deputy Kalia Chris Hanovsky, who shouted, why are you touching me, I am an old man, you are good enough for me, voted, as in the village for the dead, then they took me out, on both sides, so that we would not break out, there was a simple police, guarding the government house, seeing the policemen, I say, how can you, you can see that an illegal act is being committed, someone answered for everyone, we are not to blame, we were framed, we don't want this, we're just standing there, they just stood, Leonid Jko continues, when they were already dragging, I remembered well that on the stairwell, closer to the exit, there was a short man in a black coat and covered his face with a hat, I remember the first feeling then that he did not so much cover his face as demonstrate, look, I have nothing to do with this, I'm ashamed, I realized that it was the deputy chairman of the state security committee, Valerie Kess, and here is what Valerie Kess himself says, I had a hard time participating in this action, I had a difficult conversation with Brolish 188 I was extremely ashamed to talk to him, and in principle I did not even hide anything, I concluded for myself then that I would not participate in any actions of this kind again, no one will force me under any pretext, I'd rather quit, this is my homeland, I don't want to be thought of as a bandit who dispersed parliament, whether the command was given to beat them, I do not remember, it could have been given directly in the hall when they began to resist, and the plan was, if they resist, and you, take it out, throw it into a bus or car and take it away, Valentin Golubov, when they took me to the patio, 
There was a funnel car with internal bars, and there was an officer in command who made the soldiers throw us right into the car. Four people took one, swung it and threw it so that it would fly face first into the crater. I have glasses, before I sit on the presidium, they have a metal frame, the temples are bent, and when I was flying, I was terribly afraid that I would hit my glasses, I imagined how this frame would go into my face, I don't know how I could turn around to hit the back of my head and not my face, they beat Sasha Shooter very much, then they took a urine test from Pozniak, he immediately bled. Pozniak was probably beaten in the kidneys, it hurts, and the female doctors were crying Golubov recalls, it was later, when they were already examined by doctors, Lukashenko, Shimon, Tasovitz made political careers, being deputies of the same convocation with those who were beaten with batons that night, with their knowledge, with the knowledge of the new government. For four years they sat with them in the same hall, ate in the same buffet and pressed the same buttons for voting, sometimes, and this can be seen from the transcript, they even spoke at the same time, today, Sinitsin, like Cass, does not remember whether the decision to beat him was made 189, in any case, this was not mentioned during the discussion says Sinitsin. It was believed that, as expected, we would vacate the building, take out everyone, they will deliberately disperse and, and, what, in what form should the targeted acceleration take place, why was it necessary to vacate the building at all, Lukashenko knew this well, he was not going to liberate the building from the deputies, he liberated parliament from the ability to resist, so, the deputies were beaten and evacuated from the premises they occupied by right, evacuated is too beautiful, they were just thrown out, Valentin Golubov says, ordinary policemen drove us, there was an officer who was silent, and two conscripts, one of them asked, where can I take you, I said, to the parliament, to the former building of the central committee, that is 190, you are not allowed to go there, in the BNF, also prohibited, to the house of us, and then we were thrown out near the store ocean 191, perhaps these bans applied only to the leaders of the Belarus and Popular Front, because, for example, Deputy Leonid Ko was thrown out of the car right near the former building of the Central Committee, defiantly, the night passed in the attempts of the deputies to register beatings in the prosecutor's office and medical institutions, then they gathered in the hotel room where Leonid Ko lived and began to discuss what to do, this is no longer parliament the next meeting of the session was to be held on April 12, the day of cosmonautics, it took place, true, it did not start in the morning, at 12 o'clock, it began with an appeal by members of the Presidium of the Supreme Council, voiced by Deputy Boris Savitsky, to the Speaker of Parliament, most of the members of the Presidium at the morning meeting considered it impossible to hold meetings in this hall today. Despite this, you started the meeting here as if nothing had happened. 192, Michi Zohrib was forced to defend himself, you know, there is a big confrontation right now, and maybe one spark is enough now to start a war, who needs it? 193, the mushroom was noticeably nervous, Leonid Cole recalls, it seemed to me that, Perhaps, he did not expect that this event would end in such a forceful way, for him, it was also somewhat of a surprise, it seems that the chairman of the Supreme Council did not really expect anything like this, he was assured that everything would turn out quite peacefully, and he started the session not at 9.30 in the morning, but at 12.00 for an objective reason. At 8 o'clock Sinitsin called me by phone and said that the sappers had not yet finished all the work and would work until 12 o'clock, also, until 12 o'clock, 
There was no one at work in the presidential administration and the chairman of the cabinet of ministers, so Sinitsin assured me, and so the duty officers answered, then I contacted the president, there was also a conversation on this issue, 194 it is clear that the president also asked Machislav Ivanovich not to turn, so to speak, a working moment into a tragedy, Sapas are working, wait until 12.00, and wait, but the deputies did not come down, this was the first time that the principle of parliamentary immunity had been so treacherously violated, the beating was demonstrative, the law was brazenly violated in the presence of officials who were obligated to protect it on duty, a grave state crime has been committed, when the head of the main directorate of state security, deputy Mikhail Tasovitz, appeared in the hall, the speaker was forced to simply calm down his fellow parliamentarians, call security to the hall, we will not have lynching, and Grid had reasons for such calls, Valentin Golubov recalls, I remember that I immediately drove Tasovitz around the hall, I wanted to kill him, nobody protected him from me, only two KGB officers ran and sat, Valentin Fadrovich, not in the meeting room, not in the meeting room, the hall was buzzing, the deputies stood up and told about how they were beaten, the same Tasovitz and Defense Minister Anatoly Kosenko came up with information, Makislav Hrib announced that the Republican Prosecutor's Office opened a criminal case on the fact of beating deputies, after a break, Lukashenko came to the session, the opposition left the hall in protest, as Zinan Pozniak put it, a parliament in which troops are brought in is no longer a parliament, Lukashenko, as always, spoke of himself in the third person, did the president know or did not know about what was happening here in my residence, in the residence of the government, dear deputies, well, of course he knew, the president didn't just know, the president was informed every 30 minutes, as head of state, by the minister of defense about what was happening here at the government house 195, this recognition was very important, the deputies were beaten with the knowledge of the head of state, what follows is a complete surprise, my immediate role was to protect the lives of these people, it turns out that he defended the deputies in this way, explosives were not found, is the president to blame, moreover, because the horror is simple, what happened there, when Tasovitz called me with tears in his eyes at about 12 o'clock at night and said, Alexander Grigoryevich, it's not working out in a good way, they took out the knives, took out the blades, first, they say, we open the veins, cut off our heads and cut you, we will feel everything with blood here, well, excuse me, such threats at the presidential residence are already too much, therefore, we will show the people this film, and not only this one 196, why tease the geese, the president did not keep his word given publicly, no one saw this tape except for Leonid Sinitsin, Prime Minister Mikhail Chichir, and a few other people involved, I tried to find out what her fate was, but I had little success, Sinitsin says, they brought me this cassette in the morning, I watched it, he called Mikhail Chichir, look what happened there, we watched the cassette and then Zamatolin got it, I gave it to Zamatolin, then something happened that was bound to happen, the cassette disappeared, the authorities, who so brazenly violated the law not so long ago, suddenly rushed about, trying to destroy the video evidence, this is understandable, after all, show the people how fucks from the special forces beat politicians known throughout the country, and it is unlikely that sympathy will be on the side of those who ordered the beating, However, it still depends on who will evaluate what they see, Valentin Golubov recalls, it hurt unpleasantly when Nikolai Dementai doubted, you can't be beaten, 
Deputy Sasha Shot came out and raised his shirt in front of the Supreme Soviet, his back was full of blue bloody scars, and the man I said, that's right, they beat us a little, but this is the former speaker the man I, the government could not be afraid of such people, because they are always on its side 197, and, in the end, they beat the opposition, not the parliamentary majority, they weren't beaten, not mushroom, not the mentai, that's the main thing, but the people, the people, having seen the cold-blooded beating of unarmed people, could behave differently, and everyone understood this well, Lukashenko, Sinitsin, and Tasovets, why stir up passions, tease the geese, sometime later, the case was quietly closed, the deputies ceased to be deputies, it was not possible to interrogate key witnesses, the investigation admitted its own impotence, before the brute force applied by the highest authority, and the question that worried everyone then remained unanswered, why did Lukashenko still need all these masks shows, all for the same as Zion and Pozniak already said, having most accurately outlined the meaning of what happened, the parliament, in which the troops are brought in, is no longer the parliament 198, this is exactly what the president wanted, the parliament should be demoralized, humiliated, deprived of the ability to use the power given to it by the constitution, not without reason, after all, Lukashenko included in the list of questions for the referendum an item on the possibility of dissolving the Supreme Council by the decision of the president, and in this demoralized, doomed parliament, he broadcasts, talks like a caper cave, just inciting passions, it's not about my character, the point is the situation that is developing in the Republic of Belarus, well, I cannot allow our piece of land to burn like all the neighbors, well, I cannot allow these conflicts to exist, but you see what is happening, but you see, it was broadcast in Russia today, Belarus is closer than ever to a civil war, Russian radio broadcasts 199, there is no civil war, but the cry affects those who remain in the hole, most of them even benefit from the president winning, now all these troublemakers led by Pozniak will finally shut up, and let Lukashenko take revenge on them for our defeat in 1991, it doesn't even matter what he's hinting at, guys, not only the opposition, but all of you, you don't have long to sit in this hole, the elections are just around the corner, everything is according to the law for a long time I could not understand why Michi Zohrib at that moment took the worst possible position, did he try to pretend that nothing terrible had happened, and he unexpectedly found an answer for himself in one of his remarks, which remained in the transcript of that session, a hunger strike is not prohibited in our country, everything is in accordance with the law, this is how the Speaker of the Parliament reacts to the statement of Zion and Pozniak that the opposition intends to go on hunger strike as a sign of protest, in accordance with the law means without visible violations, within the limits of authority, if you want to starve, starve, but the president, it turns out, acted within his authority when he gave the order to evacuate the starving people the night before, and Colonel Tasovitz just carried out the order, as it turned out, agreed with the head of parliament, we can partly imagine, thanks to Lukashenko's well-known talkativeness, what Hrib and Tasovitz talked on the phone on the eve of the evacuation, the last time he, Grip, A, F, was reported about what was happening, he asked Tasovitz a question, according to his information, does the situation threaten people's lives, yes, it's threatening, then act according to the norms of the law, according to the instructions, people need to be evacuated 200, and Grip did not deny the fact of this conversation, 
the mushroom, by and large, should have been there says Valentin Golubov. Mushroom had no right to leave the Supreme Soviet for his dacha when both the building of the Supreme Soviet and the large group of deputies were in danger. On the other hand, why not leave? After all, everything is according to the norms of the law. Children of lies the opposition was beaten, but not yet finished off. She could perk up and prevent Lukashenko from winning the referendum, and he needs to win at any cost. Here, on the horizon, Vladimir Zamatolin appears, the one in whose office the video recording of the beating of the deputies disappeared. A quiet man in tinted glasses, Vladimir Zamatolin appeared in our story as early as the press secretary of the Prime Minister Vyacheslav Kabich. He was a typical army political officer, straightforward in his methods, who strove for victory at any cost, since victory, as you know, wrote off everything. During Kabich's election campaign, Zamatolin fought with Lukashenko's headquarters, proving to everyone what a great misfortune for the country would be the election of Alexander Lukashenko to the highest state post. Vyacheslav Kabich is a worthy president, but Kabich lost, and Zamatolin was left without a post. What did he know at the time? Serve, of course, not so much the idea as its powerful bearers, therefore, he was simply doomed to be next to Lukashenko, of course, if he wants it, and he wanted to, the head of the administration, Leonid Sinitsin, resisted Sinitsin's appointment for as long as he could, the last thing he needed in the team was a defector from the camp of the enemy, but Sinitsin was confronted with the fact, Zamatolin was appointed head of the administration's socio-political information department, and Sinitsin realized that soon he would have to leave, even if not now, but certainly as soon as Zamatolin wins the referendum, for which he was called, for what he was called, from that he began, the first brainchild of the new chief ideologist was a documentary film dedicated to exposing the Belarus and nationalists, Hatred, Children of Lies, filmed by Yuri Zarinok 201 by the evil will of fate, a student of the famous documentary filmmaker, people's artist of the USSR Viktor Dashuk, who taught him, first of all, as it turned out, the Kuleshov effect. At the dawn of cinema, director Lev Kuleshov did an experiment. He printed on film the same close-up, the face of the star of silent films, Ivan Moshukin, and he glued, mounted, Moshukin's face with three other plants, a steaming bowl of soup that a man greedily eats, the body of the deceased child, beautiful girl, the same viewers, looking at three fragments of the film scrolled in front of them, saw different things, the hero is hungry, the hero is mad with grief, the hero is in love and full of tenderness, but the face was the same, and its expression did not change, so, it's not about what the actor plays, but about what the viewer sees, and what he sees depends on what the director will edit the image with, this is called the Kuleshov effect, editing has become the main means of cinematic expression, take an opposition rally, we mount his image with the image of the Nazi parade, and it turns out that the opposition is fascists, on this reception, the film Azarenka is built, I reviewed it, there is nothing in any statement of the leaders of the Belarus and Popular Front that would make them related to the fascists, dancing teenagers, mounted joint to joint with a dancing fascist, could just as well be mounted with dancing Pyotr Alinikov in the Pyotr tractor drivers, Pozniak talks about Kuropati, Trusov and Nomchik talk about symbolism, Statkovich talks about language, where their hatred is and why they are children of lies is not clear, but the film made a shock impression on everyone, the Kuleshov effect used by Azarinok worked, it was shown twice on television, and the second time, at the personal request of Alexander Lukashenko himself, 
vile but honest location ka won the referendum on May 14, 1995, moreover, he won his first referendum Billy, if we give a moral assessment of the use of such techniques as children of lies, but honestly, if we talk about the vote count, the majority in society believe their president, this is obvious, the coat of arms and the flag are a search for symbols that reflected that period of the state of society Leonid Sinitsin justifies himself, this symbolism was wanted by society, this is what the referendum showed, it's hard to object to this, but when a politician in such a situation is guided solely by the desire to display that period of the state of society it means that he is indifferent to the past and does not look too far into the future. The referendum was held on the day of elections of deputies of the Supreme Council of the 13th Convocation. I was nominated as a candidate for deputy by my former colleagues and students in my hometown of Grodno, and I remember well how those voters who were in favor of the change of symbols, and those who were against, looked at me as an enemy. After my departure from power, a little more time passed, for everyone I remained Lakashenko's man, someone hated me because I brought Lakashenko to power, and someone hated me because I betrayed Lakashenko, but the meeting with voters in one of the schools made the biggest impression on me, when an elderly teacher attacked me, are you changing the symbols, what did you think about us? Four years have not passed since we explained to the children why the coat of arms and the flag were replaced. Now, again, are you taking us for prostitutes? It is clear that the cry was not addressed to me personally. I spoke a lot about the uselessness of changing symbols during the election campaign, but she had no one else to turn her pain to. Indeed, not even four years had passed. The results of the referendum have not yet been officially announced, and Ivan Titenkov, the supply manager of the Republic climbed onto the roof of the presidential residence with accompanying persons. The flag, which had not even lost the status of the state flag, was torn to shreds, and the president's affairs manager personally signed on the racks. These shreds were then secretly sold for a hundred dollars. This amount, of course, was not estimated at the signature of the presidential affairs manager 202 and not the material on which he set it. The symbol was valued. After all, it's not every day that supply managers sign on scraps of a national shrine. Valentina Trigubovich says, on the day Titankov tore the flag I returned home, and immediately in the hallway, I sat on the floor, and tears flowed by themselves, Yanka, the son, came out of his room, he already knew what had happened, picked me up from the floor and said, Mom, we'll get it all back, he was then 13 years old, and I believe that this generation will bring everything back. The action on the roof was filmed with a video camera, the tape went from hand to hand, the next day the recording was seen by many, the historian and human rights activist Tatyana Pratko recalls 203, the editor of one of the Belarusian publishing houses, Zmitsa Senko, and I went to the prosecutor on duty, his last name was Pozniak, and I say, this is the situation. I am a citizen of Belarus, a serious crime has been committed, and I want the perpetrator to be prosecuted. The poor prosecutor blushed, I have never seen such red people anywhere else, he is asking, who did it? I answer, according to my information, Mr. Titankov, is he an official or not? Because if this is committed by an official, then this circumstance increases the severity of the crime. I don't know, you must know whether he is an official or not. The prosecutor finds out that the president's affairs manager is an official. I wrote a statement, he took it and went somewhere. Here we are sitting with Smitzer and thinking whether they will accept or not accept the application. 
He returned and says, yes, I will accept the application. The obvious misunderstanding with the fact that the application was accepted can be easily explained. The former prosecutor general Vasily Shilodinov had already resigned his powers, and the new one, Vasily Kapitan, had yet to be confirmed in his position at the Supreme Council, and who knows how the parliament will react to the execution committed over the national flag, so it's better to be safe. Record decided to review collectively, Tatyana Pratko, as an applicant, was invited to watch a historical tape, she recalls, I was encouraged when a young man sitting next to me, he was the head of the crime laboratory, said, if necessary, we will make a portrait from each of this film. People are imprisoned for a sack of potatoes, but here it is a purely criminal offense, a pure article, nowhere to go, and when the screening is on, I am sitting in the front row, the prosecutors are behind me, I hear comments, maybe he's tearing his pants, there was the crackling of a torn flag, I turn and say indignantly, and you check what he tears, trousers or a flag, no one came out without pants, you check, that's why I turned to you, well, here, of course, they clicked on him, because everything was visible very well, how they write, sign and put the date, on videotape, together with Titankov, several participants in this shameful action were recorded, you can also hear them talking, well, if Pozniak sees this, let him choke 204 Tatyana Pratko continues, I answer this remark, not only Pozniak would have committed suicide from this, my feelings are offended, I am offended as a Belarusian, this is what they were counting on, the insult was inflicted on Belarus, all its patriots, defiantly, now Lukashenko could calmly see who would react to this, man is weak but the prosecutor's office managed to get out of the predicament, Tatyana Pratko, then investigator Novikov calls me, the month termants, and he is so happy, he says, Tatyana Sergeyevna, I figured it out, well, what did you come up with, he shows me the decision that Titankov, as the president's affairs manager, disposed of the worn out flag in violation of the current instructions, and a little postscript, the president has been informed about this, but I do remember investigator Novikov, a young blonde, it seems to me, it was he who, back in the time of cabbage, studied the question of whether the youth union of Belarus has the right to be considered the legal successor of the LKSMB and the VLKSM, he interrogated me and other leaders of the organization, strictly upholding the letter of the law, the second time we met, it seems, with the same investigator Novikov already in 1998, he was interested in what meaning I put into the wording, the president is weak, I responded with a syllogism, the president is a man, all people are weak, therefore, the president is also weak. Now, having learned that this prosecutor laundered Ivan Titankov so zealously, you think that people are really weak, even prosecutors, although, even if I confuse, and it was a different investigator, it's all the same, people are weak, Tatyana Pratko, as she admits, of course, said there everything that she thought about the prosecutor's office and about the investigator. The flag is a symbol, if we do not preserve our symbols, then there is no people at all, no society, and everything ends, today you do not support the opposition, you cover up malfeasance, and tomorrow your daughter will be raped, because crime does not know its own and others, when the forces of law do not operate, but the law of force operates, then there are no friends and foes, everyone falls into this meat grinder, and what do you think, Novikov tells me, I'll bring you for insulting the prosecutor's office, I say, can I be charged with insulting the prosecutor's office, but Titankov for insulting the national flag is impossible, weak, 
Thus, the case of insulting the national pride of the Belarusians was closed. Ally Oksandr Lukashenko probably also counted on its utilization. The most dangerous enemy on May 14, 1995, not only a referendum took place, there were also parliamentary elections, more precisely, they did not take place, even a simple majority of the number of deputies of the Supreme Council provided for by the Constitution was not elected, the turnout for the referendum miraculously coincided with the absence from the elections, although the same electorate voted, in 141 out of 260 districts, the elections did not take place due to the absence of more than half of the voters, but the referendum took place there to 205, the president did not want these elections, everything that he publicly said during the parliamentary election campaign came down to one thing, you will be deceived anyway, the voters interpreted it as, don't go to vote, and did not go, but the election revealed exactly what kind of mood reigned in the minds of most voters, it was the first election campaign in a real multi-party system, the communists were able to get 28 deputies into the Supreme Soviet of the 13th Convocation, the Agrarians, 30, the Democratic Bloc and Civil Accord, only one deputy each, the elections were lost by the leaders of all democratic parties and even former democratic candidates for the presidency, Zinan Pozniak, Gennady Karpenko, Stanislav Shashkovich, it is clear why the Democrats were doomed to lose, in the mass consciousness they were associated with the Belarus and Popular Front, and the main ideological campaign was waged against the Belarus and Popular Front and its allies, they got the most during the elections, but on the whole, the 1995 elections were still different from what began to happen in the country after 1996, at least in the fact that the authorities have not interfered with all the candidates in a row, both the machine of mass falsifications and the press of administrative pressure have not yet been debunked, all the same, there remained a semblance of a competition of ideas, albeit not quite fair, the opposition had not been given television air for a long time, but still a competition, and as a result, the republic found itself without a legislative power, the powers of the old Supreme Council ended, and the new one could not start working, this situation suited Alexander Lukashenko quite well, he repeatedly pushed the Supreme Council of the 12th Convocation to stop plenary sessions and even held a meeting with elected deputies of the 13th Convocation, hinting unambiguously that in this composition, that is, without opposition representatives, who had a chance to get into Parliament in the by-elections they could start their work. If they did this, the Supreme Council would immediately lose its legitimacy, which was all Lukashenko needed 206, but this idea didn't work. The new parliamentarians declared their commitment to the Constitution and their readiness to wait until the rest of the deputies are elected. Here Michis Ohrib took the stage again, although the Supreme Council of the 12th Convocation de facto no longer existed, Machis Ohrib convened a regular session, in strict accordance with the Constitution. The move was unexpected, after all, the deputies already a few months ago, immediately after the scuffle, as is usual among the Slavs, drank at the ceremony of dissolving the Supreme Council, said goodbye to their mandates, and took pictures for memory, the point has been made, and suddenly it turns out that this is not a dot, but just an ellipsis, and the session began its work. The quorum was not always gathered and with great difficulty, Lukashenko took care, some of the deputies were lured to work for him, 
someone was simply asked not to come to Minsk under the threat of dismissal, by presidential decree no. 336, deputies were deprived of their immunity status, but many came, apparently, those whose sense of honor overcame fear, willingly or unwittingly, Hrib and the Supreme Council, which resisted the dissolution, made it clear to Lukashenko who exactly his main enemy is, of course, not the mushroom himself, his time was rapidly passing, especially not his former associates, with whom Lukashenko managed to get even, not the restrained government, not the pacified press, not the sofa parties and not the uninitiated trade unions, and not even the Supreme Council, his main enemy, and this has already become quite clear, was the Constitution which prevented him from living and ruling in accordance with his own ideas, it is obvious that Lukashenko was ready to destroy the constitution, but first he had to break with all his previous obligations, Lukashenko cuts off the ends Lukashenko needed to finally part with his own past, which was personified by the first person in his election team and the second person in the state, the head of his administration, Leonid Sinitsin. Sinitsin was friends with many deputies, he remembered gatherings and drinking, he was on you even with the oppositionists, yes, and it was he who actually cemented the old team. His distance from the body began in the spring of 1995, this became noticeable by the way his waiting room suddenly emptied, where there used to be a bus from crowded petitioners, by the fact that the yellow telephone without a disc called less and less often, a direct connection with the president, his opinion during personnel appointments ceased to be decisive. The candidacies of new appointees popped up out of nowhere, in a word, signs of impending disgrace were visible to any official, Sinitsin himself understood that stylistically he fell out of the new time, in which discussions ended with the use of spatsnaz batons, Lukashenko no longer needed allies, he needed soldiers, and the example of Zematalin showed him that the best soldier is the soldier who has previously been at fault, and the best campaigner is, in general, the one who came to you from the camp of the enemy, on October 7, 1995, Alexander Lukashenko dismissed the head of the administration, Leonid Sinitsin, and Mikhail Myosnikovich, the former head of the campaign headquarters of Vyacheslav Kabich, left by Lukashenko in the government as deputy prime minister, took his place. Myosnikovich was not just a deputy prime minister, back in 1994, during a speech by Alexander Lukashenko to senior KGB officials, the latter was asked to answer a note, what will you do with the richest man in the country, Mikhail Myosnikovich, the answer came immediately, on merit, then the answer of the presidential candidate looked quite specific, but today it is clear that it was extremely ambiguous, it is quite possible that the main merit for which Myosnikovich was left in the government was the crushing defeat of Vyacheslav Kabich 207. Significant was not only the dismissal of Sinitsin from the post of head of the administration, significant was the appointment of his successor, the entire vertical of power had to learn, the former fighter with the officials of the old school is gone. Lukashenko decided to restore the old system of government, because only this system could guarantee him a calm stay at the top of power up to the carriage race, an honorary funeral at the very cemetery where young Mikhail Myosnikovich once accompanied prominent figures of the Communist Party of Belarus on their last journey, Lukashenko needed the stability of his own power, true. So far he has not yet felt that the highest percentage of stability is just in the cemetery, as a young man, he did not intend to go there, first, you should have buried your main enemy, he already knew, as we remember, his name, 
and was preparing to strike him down, the Constitution was to be buried, part i.e., confrontation on July 25, 1996, the reception room of the Deputy Prime Minister of the Cabinet of Ministers of the Republic of Belarus Sinitsin L.G. was empty, on the table, in two vases, were flowers, which were suspiciously few, Secretary Elena Alexandrovna, smiling as usual, opened the door and let me through, I came to wish my former boss a happy birthday, he was still Deputy Prime Minister, and I was already working as Deputy Editor-in-Chief at the Oppositional Belruskaya Delova Gazeta, that is, we were on opposite sides of the barricades, but on my birthday he called me, and on his birthday I came to him with traditional congratulations, there were more flowers in the office, but still not as many as in 1994. When the head of the administration, five days after the inauguration of Alexander Lukashenko, celebrated his 40th birthday, maybe the date was not so round now, or maybe something that had not yet happened hovered in the corridors of power, in the restroom, where the hospitable host showed me, there was an uncorked and one-third empty bottle of expensive cognac, a neatly cut lemon on a saucer, an almost full box of chocolates testified that there were few visitors before me, you shouldn't have left Sinitz inside after we took a sip and set aside our glasses, there was no need to rush, you see what happened, that you left, you left, if they were there it would be easier for him, that you is about Guncha, to whom him, to him, Alexander Grigoryevich, after all, you can work. You can, no matter what you write in your newspaper, you romantics have fled, we pragmatists have been abandoned, we are now disentangling, raising the economy, see what growth, the growth of the economy was felt not only by the expensive cognac and luxurious tie of the birthday man, but also by the models of Belarus and tractors and pipe layers standing in the closet. They were left after the joint Belarus and Kazakh exhibition, on the desktop lay a miniature volume of Shakespeare's sonnets, which I had presented two years ago, the market will fix everything, you didn't want to understand this scene it's in assured me, getting more and more excited, capital will come, investors will need normal laws, a normal political system, after all, without this money will never come to the country. Does he understand it, Alexander Grigoryevich something, he's a pragmatist, he understands everything better than anyone, when he wants, Sinitsin's speech became less and less convincing, he probably felt it himself, and therefore got more and more excited, at some point, he even jumped up and began to pace around the room, waving his arms, well, what kind of dictatorship is here, and then, is Pinochet not a dictator, and look how the economy has raised, for another 20 minutes I listened to the reasoning of the birthday man about the inevitability of the prosperity of Belarus under the leadership of its first president, the first president calmly looked at us from the portrait and wisely kept his mustache silent, taking advantage of the pause, I made my request, one Russian businessman is ready to invest in one of the machine building plants and asked for a meeting with Sinitsin, who was in charge of machine building, let him come let him come on Wednesday Sinitsin said after a pause, tomorrow the security council, I will not be up to you, and the day after tomorrow, let him come, and you come, the next day, Tuesday, the publisher of BDG, Martsev, approached me, puffing on his pipe, and sat, blowing another ring of smoke, and why was Sinitsin filmed, how is it, removed, removed, and all, just announced by Reuters, you should call your former boss, see if he agrees to give us a comment, 
and here's what happened, the next day after Sinitsin's birthday, a meeting of the Security Council was held, at which, in the presence of government members, directors of major industrial enterprises, governors and editors-in-chief of newspapers, Security Council Secretary Victor Scheiman scolded the government, and first of all, Deputy Prime Minister Sergei Lin, Lin had worked as a vice premier since the time immemorial in Kabichev's time, he did not ask for trouble unnecessarily and, as befits an experienced official, he knew how to remain silent, even now he was silent, knowing that it was not about him at all, he was only an excuse. Lukashenko took the floor and supported Shimon with harsh criticism of the entire government. The members of the government were dejectedly silent, ahead of the referendum on the new constitution, and climb on the rampage was not worth it. With the unlimited power that the president will be endowed with, Sinitsin tried to take the floor, but Lim stopped him. Leonid Georgievich, don't get excited, wait. There was not long to wait, Alexander Lukashenko finally fixed his gaze on Sinitsin himself and calmly remarked, and you, Leonid Georgievich, I trust less and less, Sinitsin got up, if there is no trust, Alexander Grigoryevich, I can't work Sinitsin spoke in a hollow and quick voice, as always when he said something very important, I am ready to submit my resignation. There was a heavy silence, the resignation is accepted Lukashenko said after a pause, with a sigh, Deputy Prime Minister Vasily Dolgolev got up from his seat, Alexander Grigoryevich, together with Sinitsin we came to the government, we will leave with him, Vasily Borisovich, don't get excited, you will still work, Prime Minister Mikhail Chich reached out to Sinitsin, whispered, justifying himself, Lenya, I'm sorry, my son's wedding is coming soon, how can I leave here, at least you warned me or something, after the end of the meeting of the Security Council, Sinitsin handed over the statement to Lukashenko, he endured for several days and, having invited him to the office, returned the application with the resolution, think about it, Sinitsin said he thought, but he remains of his own mind, Leonid Sinitsin recalls, we spoke quite frankly, and we agreed that we were politically divorced, I wanted to build a normal market country, a democratic state based on the rule of law, and we were no longer on the road, I told him that I did not accept the policy of strengthening the dictatorship and the inevitable isolation as a result, because I did not understand how to carry it out, I spoke verbatim, there is no resource for this in our country, dictatorship is expensive, in order to somehow develop under it, you need financial, natural and other resources, you need to have gold mines or oil wells, Lukashenko replied, you've gotten away from people, you don't understand what they want, we broke up, but not as enemies, but as people who worked together, whose paths diverged, a few days later, Sinitsin's resignation was officially confirmed, and the Narod Nevalia newspaper printed the text of his resignation letter, President of the Republic of Belarus Lukashenko AG, from Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Belarus Sinitsin LG, statement, serving the state for me, I believe, as for you, was, is and will be the highest goal of life, that is why I have been with you from the very beginning, but life has shown that we perceive the political and socio-economic situation in the Republic differently, in my opinion, the principles and methods that you have been following recently when governing the state are erroneous, I ask you to seriously consider this, my beliefs do not allow me to follow such a course, in this regard, I ask you to accept my resignation, with respect to the President L. G. Sinitz in July 31, 1996, together with Sinitsin, only economy minister Georgi Bade left the government 208, 
the country was moving towards a referendum and a new constitution.